Yeah, yeah go ahead and start. Um, we'll, we'll just see where we're at when we get to the end of this. If you guys want to stick around, I brought some neat toys we can look up and play around with. Do some shielding the phones. You want to work with the trying to acquire your own phone. Um, I don't want to put that in the presentation because that's just you know one of those awkward. You know, no one wants to watch a video of people plugging in phones into devices and extracting data. So what we'll do is we'll do the formal. Let's do this for the camera part, and then we'll wrap that up, and then we'll start breaking out the little toys and guys play if you want to. Answer any questions, download some stuff, possibly. So, uh, to give you a brief introduction for you guys that haven't uh, crossed paths with me in any time, uh, my name is Josh Brunny. Uh, of course, I'm on Twitter. I'm an assistant professor at Marshall University. Have been since 2012. I'm in my fifth year there. Uh, in my prior life, I was a, first an acute computer forensic examiner a QA manager, and then ultimately ended up being tech leader before I left uh, the lab to teach, essentially. Uh, nowadays, I do uh, ISO assessments for labs all across the country, uh, federal, state, uh, international labs, um, traveled overseas, and actually has stood up labs in other countries for international labs. So I have a good deal of experience in how these labs are set up and, you know, what what computer forensic labs around the country private are doing to combat this cell phone investigative issue here. And then I did them in my prior life as well. You know, I was, if you've ever worked in a digital forensics lab, you do a lot of cell phones. And it's a, it's a huge, you know, problem and an, an issue nationally right now of, of trying to get rid of cell phone background issues. So... Uh, nowadays, I spend a lot of my time towards research, software development, trying to solve problems to move this field forward. Uh, I am a, the primary instructor for our uh, it's a DFI 467 course, which is a mobile device forensics. It's a four-hour course. It's part of our digital forensics bachelor of science curriculum. Uh, in that curriculum, we're one of three universities that set up. Uh, we're offering the uh, self right. Uh, certification track curriculum, and what that is is that is a the CCLO, which is the Certified Certified Logical Operator, and then they ultimately set for their Certified Physical Analyst. Uh, that's just one of the many tools that exist out there commercially that, that is and we, we offer that that certification. So uh, today's session, I'm not going to turn you into a mobile examiner in just a couple of hours. That that just the, there's there's too much stuff. There's too much background that needs set in order for that to happen, and I'll talk a little bit about why that's the case here today. But uh, if you are interested in that, get in contact with me. We do have that program right in their backyard here. Unfortunately, it's a non-online program. Uh, beware of programs that are like that. Taking a cell phone course online, as you would probably think, unless you're working with emulated devices, doesn't really work out too well. You're probably not going to have a good experience in doing that. So personal opinion. I don't think we're quite there yet, but, um, you know, it can be done, but we, we just don't we haven't done it yet because of the articulation we have. Uh, I am a certified, uh, just about every certification you can think of in mobile forensics I've picked up, uh, not because it's just the procedure and the certification. I just want to learn more. I'm, I'm one of those, you know, academics for life, so I want to pick up as much knowledge as I can. I uh, wrote a chapter in the Syngress book on uh, mobile device forensics. Uh, I'm going to try to get that up in a link today. I know the, the video is going up online, but I want to pass that information off to you a lot of these documents and stuff that you can uh, take back to your workplace and lab to work with. I'm also on the uh, NIST. If you're not familiar with the National Institute of Standards and Technology, they uh, are trying now to develop what they call the Scientific Area Committees, uh, which is Basically, they're looking at all the fields of forensic science again, and they're trying to develop and vet standards and procedures, kind of a more of a best practice moving forward. Uh, it used to be handled by the scientific working groups on digital evidence. Um, we don't know how long SWIGDE is going to stand up, and I'll talk about SWIGDE a little bit later on, uh, but we're still running that. We're still involved in that, and, and I'll give you some, some info here a little bit on that. But I am a member of that. 
have been for a couple of years now. One of my areas of focus in that is uh, the educational standards uh, in colleges and universities of what, what should be the requirement. It's kind of like the NICE for digital forensics, if you're familiar with the NICE framework. Uh, the NICE framework is the information security, information assurance. We're dealing with the information or the digital forensic side of it. Uh, so you know, it's it's nice to have people you know who've had experience in the field driving what these students are learning in the college and university environment. And that's one of my big qualms with the academic environment right now. Sometimes we we inundate them with stuff that really is just not useful in the real world. At least when I went through college, that was the case. Learning a lot about stuff that I'll never use again in my life. So we're trying to weave things back together and uh, create a good foundational curriculum for all of these different colleges around the country to follow. At least that's our goal. Right now I'm stuck. Microsoft has taken control where they want me to push that update. Say no. So here's our schedule, and this is the way we're going to break it down. I'm going to break it down into four parts. Uh, first off, I'm just going to give you a kind of an overview of what the field is right now. Where are we at, and what's the future trends going to look like in regards to how we handle mobile devices? And that's going to be a big, big, big thing moving forward because the status quo, the way we're doing things right now, is the, not the way we're going to be doing things tomorrow from an investigative standpoint. So law enforcement's going to have to change with the changing tides. And even the private sector folks, uh, the way that we do things now is just going to have to change. Uh, then we're going to get into the terms and technology behind it. Um, give me a brief overview of how mobile networks work. Um, I'm not going to throw you know a whole lot of stuff at you today on that one but we'll get into the basic technology behind it. Also, we'll get into the sources of mobile device evidence. Where does this stuff come from? Where to look for things? And what resources do you have at your disposal uh, that you can pick up on your own? Additional training, uh, where can you get certain pieces of software from? What's open source, what's not open source, what's proprietary, what's non-proprietary? Uh, kind of, I want you to walk out of here today not thinking, man, you know, uh, that, that was a waste of my time. Oh, I, I didn't know that that existed. Let me go back and try to download that and see if uh, it'll work in my lab. And then the last part is just the whole seizure of mobile devices. I think we underscore that. Sometimes we get too deep in the weeds, we forget to cut the grass. And that's a truthful statement. I know I do. And many times, you know, I get so technical with things, I forget the basic foundations of stuff uh, that I learned years and years ago. So we're going to go back over that and the whole changing tide of how we seize devices and nuances behind that. So first is just the whole overview of devices and crime. Now you guys know what they're used for. You, you've seen it in the news lately. You know that there's problems, inherent problems, of putting data on a mobile device. And you know the picture, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. The two pictures there, I could probably just drop that slide and, and hit, hit the point to home here. But there's a reason that Hillary Clinton had an aide destroy cell phones. Plain and simple. Was it to get rid of the data or to get rid of the data? Don't know. But you can see here that a lot of different types of crimes can be propagated and can be pushed forward from a cell phone. And in most cases, these are all crimes that I've seen as an examiner back in my day. And it, You've worked with cell phones from a law enforcement capacity. You've seen all of that. Now, if you're working on the private side of things, what's your requirement from an investigative standpoint? And I say this, and, and I, I do mean this wholeheartedly. If you're working in a private sector and you're taking evidence in, work it as if it may make it to court at some point. Because I see that happen a lot on the private side of things. Where a phone is seized, it's improperly seized, it was an internal issue at first, and then all of a sudden it becomes an issue where the employee is now downloading child porn, or it becomes a financial crime and goes to federal court all of a sudden. And then that evidence is being scrutinized at a criminal level when it was never intended to go into a criminal court. Now the person who did the initial examination at the private sector side of things is now being scrutinized in court as they would a law enforcement officer. So, you know, this is where 
the, the neat part about digital forensics is that we should put ourselves to the same standard, meaning that seizing a cell phone, whether you have a badge on your chest or you have a logo on your chest, should be the same, at least in my opinion. The way that we process that device, doesn't matter if we have a badge on our chest or a logo on our chest with our company name on it, it should be the same. It really should be. So, really, just at the end of the day, this could pretty much be just about any crime. Now, you're probably familiar with burner phones, uh, what, what the concept of burner phones is. And for those of you that haven't heard of a burner phone before, it's basically self-explanatory. It is a phone that a person has picked up for the cases of just throwing it out and doing away with it. Um, I did a study abroad back in England a few years back, well, back when I was in, in grad school, and spent a couple of months over there. And I went over and I took my phone with me, and I, I added an international plan. And this was back, you know, when plans were expensive, you know, just to have voice data. And I get over there and I'm paying like, I think, like 100 bucks extra a month to keep this international plan. And I'm, I'm just right outside of London there in Kensington. And I happen to be walking by an orange store. And, you know, you guys, you know, the orange is like the AT&T of England, or at least that time it was, and, and Vodafone. But I walked into an orange store, and I'm just saying, you know, I'm just going to see what kind of cell phones they have here. And I walk into the store, 25 pounds later, no credit check, no credit card, no nothing. Straight cash, homie. I'm laying it down on the desk. I'm walking out with a phone, not just with a phone, but with a nice Android phone with a data plan and a voice plan and a phone number. I powered down my device, left it off for the entire time I was in England and Ireland. They had no idea of who that phone was tied to. They had no idea what my name was at that place. I didn't give them my name. I think if I did, I think I gave them a fake name, if I recall correctly. It was like, you know... Um, I think it was Leopold Cougar is the name that I gave them. So if there's ever this Leopold J. Cougar that, that comes up, you know, and they're like, is there... Was there was that a regular O2 store? Uh, or it, was, it was one of those... Oh, like um, it, was, it was a stand-up shop, but it wasn't like a kiosk or anything like that. It was oh, just a strange Because England store. requires an address. They do now. They do now. Um, you can get those on the black market. Rather well, right. right. Yeah. That's why I asked that. But they, they require address for even though you can make that up, which is, I, you know, yeah, I wonder what the what what it is if you're an American citizen now, because I, I think they just kind of like, you know, no, they we don't want to do it. Yeah, they Did you travel up there recently, recently? But you can give them a train station. I mean, yeah, ten sixty West States. Yeah, and, and address in the states. You know, the thing that stops us here in the states. One of the the things that that a lot of providers do is they require a credit check now. So, you know, the easy way to get around that is you can just load up. A, <laughs> well, you know, they require, you could, you could either get a prepaid card and you can try to bypass the credit check. That way, if they do a full-blown credit check against your name, that's kind of hard to bypass unless you give them a fake ID or something. Uh, so a lot of providers are, are a little more attuned to that, but my goodness, an eBay auction, I could have a phone in hand uh, that's been whitelisted on the network and, you know, easily have a burner phone in hand. Uh, we served a search warrant years ago with the city PD, and, and when we see the devices, uh, we had probably about 25 brand new iPhones. And it was a drug kingpin, and, and you know he was kind of the, the ringleader of it. And when we got into his safe, he just had these boxes of iPhones. And what are you doing with all these iPhones? Why do you have all these new iPhones? And then he had like 16 iPhones, so every month he was just changing out, starting a new iPhone. So if you got a scratch on one, or... You know, he just got tired of it. He just pulled a new one out of the safe. Well, someone had done a smash and grab at a store, taking a bunch of those phones, and they were paying him off that way rather than paying him cash for drugs, and he was taken. Imagine the investigative challenge of just getting this guy's footprint. I mean, he had 20 phones over the period of three months, all with data on them. So you're having to process them separately. There's a lot of redundant data on each one of those devices. So he was he was connecting his Gmail account every single time he would set up a new phone, connect to iCloud, set it up as you would a new phone, and we had to go through all that redundant data and parse it out. So it was a, it was a challenge because he was essentially using a legit phone, 
but it's like he had 20 burner phones in play there. So he could have scrubbed the text messages off of those and got rid of them. We found uh, just earlier this year with the Paris terrorists, they use burner phones. And it's, it's a no-brainer if you're a criminal. Why don't you just use a phone that you can throw away when you're done with it? Destroy it. It's very, very hard to track down. If I can track it back to a username, then that's where the trouble begins. But even here in the States, you know, that, that can be uh, kind of an issue in itself because um, I remember, that, and I'm, it's going to be just a, a lot of war stories today. Uh, I wasn't originally slated to give this presentation, by the way. I'm the, the Tony Romo of, of mobile forensic uh, presentations here. Uh, they kind of threw me in at the last minute. Decent quarterback, I can throw well. I have all the tools of the trade, but I'm no Dak Prescott, right? <laughs> anyway, um, the, uh, the, the investigation that we were working on uh, involved a, a threat that was given to a, uh, to a dignitary over a phone call that was made. So uh, it was a female voice, and we, had no, we tried to trace the number back. The number went dead. Uh, there was no provider that really, it was one of those uh, Boost Mobile phones. I don't know if you've seen those Boost Mobile around here. I'm really Boost Mobile. So we started tracing back, and uh, we, we found that, you know, that particular um, SIM card was sold to Target during this period of time. And the easiest way to, to trace it back, I'm thinking, okay, well, if we can't trace the SIM card back to a user, we certainly trace it back to a store transaction, right? So we traced it back to a store transaction. Went to the Target store and said, hey, do you have records of these phones being sold? Yes, we do. So they had records of that phone being sold. We went back to the security camera, and lo and behold, there's the person going through fake ID, buying this phone, trying to pay cash for it. They put it on a credit card. So we had a user to tie it back to now. So the, the credit, I think, if I'm not mistaken, I believe the credit card was legit. It was the ID that they gave behind it. Was, it was kind of an odd, weird thing. I, I don't think they ever thought that anyone would trace them back to Target. So I thought they, were, they thought they were good to go, that they would just get to the end of the number and it'd be at that end. But you're seeing more and more of this, and you're going to see more and more of this. Uh, you can spoof caller IDs. You know, that's a pretty easy thing nowadays. But... You know, from a device standpoint, if I want to evade, you know, certain controls that are put in place to catch, to catch me, I'm just going to fire up a burner phone and then I'm just going to totally go dark on most of the whitelisted networks that are out there. That's what they did. It wasn't encryption that was the problem. It was the burner phone that was the problem. So you'll see more and more of this. Tell me what that is right there. What's it look like? It looks like an iPhone to me, but then you're looking at the screen and things just look a little different on these. This is a Chinese variant of an iPhone. And uh, I was telling Norm earlier before we got started that we got one of these in the lab one time. And, uh, you know, I hear it, I, I look at it, you know, I'm processing, I say, you know, this is an iPhone. So, you know, I set it up and I plug it in, you know, start the acquisition process and it would not recognize. I'm like, hang on for a second. Something's up. So I look at the back of it. The back looks legit. Now, this is not booted up. I'm not looking at the screen at this time. But I'm looking at the back of it. Things look legit. And I boot it up. And the screen looks okay, but it kind of looks like this right here. And I'm just perplexed. I'm like, well, it doesn't look like an iPhone, but it looks like an iPhone. It's like that, that History Channel guy. It's not an iPhone, but it's an iPhone, right? Probably be make a good meme, right? But uh, I look on the bottom, and there's a little subtle difference. Uh, the lightning cable, um, or what do they call that? The mini, what do you call that? H, what, what's Apple called their port now? Is it lightning? lightning? Is it lightning? So the lightning port wasn't a lightning port. It was a mini USB port. I'm like, okay, something's up here. So I open up the phone, and even the guts of the phone looked a lot like an iPhone. But, but the internals of that particular phone looked, and it had the walk of the walk of the iPhone, but it wasn't an iPhone. It was just a souped-up version of Android. I'll show you a picture of it. I put them side by side. So this is a picture of the actual phone. Uh, this is my iPhone here. This is the burner phone there.
So you can see there's really not much differences between the two. If you're looking at them, you know, from, at face value, they look primarily the same. So that can be a concern in device investigations. You may encounter something like that. Chinese burner phones are becoming more and more popular as, you know, the market becomes more and more global. As criminals become more attuned to this, it's easier for me to jump on eBay, get a Chinese burner phone, and then evade all of the controls that we have here in America, the kind of structure that we have to investigate. As long as that phone is whitelisted on a U.S.-based network, we're going to be kind of, we'll at least be able to connect, and we'll, we won't be able to trace that back to a user. I hear a lot of people say, well, that can't happen because this, this, and this. Well, new stories pop up where you see that, that, and that happen. So it's, you know, like what you're hearing and what, you know, what, you know, what common sense tells you and then what you're seeing in regards to these crimes is, is a totally different story. So uh, it could be a possibility. This is a new thing that just a couple of years ago that, that went through the courts. I don't know if you guys remember this, but the Supreme Court, uh, two years ago, made a ruling that you now need a warrant to search cell phones. Before that, it used to be what we called a search incident to arrest, meaning that if I arrested a person for, let's just say, a drug charge, and there were 14 cell phones that was on that person upon arrest, I could take all 14 of those cell phones, submit them to the lab, and have no requirement for a search warrant. The court said, hang on a second there. There's a reasonable expectation of privacy behind those particular phones now. Now we have to obtain a search warrant in order to get those the data off of those devices. So it wasn't, I think most of the law enforcement folks was like, yeah, we'll deal with that. That's, that's fine. I think all of us were like, you know what, that's probably a, a good thing now. So it's not hard to get a search warrant. I know most of you folks are, are non-law enforcement, but keep in mind, when you're dealing with devices like this, you're dealing with reasonable expectations of privacy, unless the phone is company-owned. So be careful about this whole idea of bringing your own device into the network because you're going to be dealing with issues like that. So, you know, think about this. If I come in and I really wreak havoc on your network with this particular device right here, and I leave... How hard is it going to be for you to get data off of this device? It's going to be nearly impossible, right, without a search warrant. So, you know, I look at, at, at certain companies, I'm like, be very careful about your BYOD policies because if something does happen, unless you go through a law enforcement agency, it's going to be really hard to get that data back. So the data that you might need to, to further that investigation. So keep that in mind uh, that on the law enforcement side, even we need a warrant. Um, yes, sir. Here is here is the loophole in the hole, and, and this is going to be addressed in the high court here at some point. You guys know that if I put my thumbprint in there, I can unlock my phone pretty easily without the need of a password. A lot of law enforcement agencies right now were bypassing that because it was biometric and not considered a password. Uh, they were going in where they were forced, judges were forcing people, literally, to put their finger on that and provide the biometric password to get around that. Um, Norm, you've seen that, haven't you? Where, where judges have literally said, this is not a password issue, this is not an encryption, this is not a privacy issue. I am requiring you by the court to put your thumb on that 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 particular biometric pass there. The issue is if I don't put my thumb on that particular part or that particular button, I think it's 72 hours, it requires a password. So you have a very time sensitive a little small window there that if they don't do that in that time period, you lose the ability to do that. How long will that last? That's not going to last very long. I'm telling you, you know, traditionally a, a person who studies this, who reads the news a lot, who's around an academic environment with a lot of lawyers and interact with a lot of judges, that's going to eventually bubble up to the high court, and the high court's going to say, uh, it's going to be under the same control as the passwords. Right now, it's flying under the radar, and, and literally federal, state, and local agencies I wouldn't say are exploiting that, but it's kind of a workaround to get into some of these devices. Um, 
there's some laws in England, and, and don't quote, you know, I'm not a, a, a master of, of English law, but they do have laws in the books where failure to provide that kind of data as a password is usually automatically, uh, I believe it's like two years in jail that you can get for not providing that data. We don't have that control here in the state. Um, but, yeah, for biometric data, as far as I know, they were holding people in contempt for not putting their thumb on their own device to track it. Which is kind of a scary, uh, you know, an option because if the person refuses to do that, they're looking at jail time for data that may not even be on that device. So yeah. it's it's a it's a it's a weird world we live in when it comes to mobile devices and how we access that data. Now we're dealing with, and, and this is even on the side of iOS, but Android especially, where we're dealing with malware and spyware that's being propagated onto these devices. Um, you know, you're looking at uh, where text messages are being sent. I get those text messages every once in a while. They're like, click this link, you know, and I'm like, no, you know, I, I'm not going to click that link. I don't need a Russian bride. I don't need, you know, a whatever type of product that you're going to send to me, but certainly I'm not going to communicate with you through this random text message. But... You know, a lot of people will inadvertently click those things. And once that gets into your network, once that's kind of set up shop, that's going to be hard to scrub out because you're dealing with, with malware that's, that's contained on devices. So first and foremost, it's going to be hard to get into that device if it's password protected. And then secondly, you got to find where the malware is on that particular device, especially with Android. That can hide in a lot of different places. So, you know... Malware analysis or, or mobile, you know, what I call mobile pen testing malware analysis on mobile devices is a whole specialized field in itself. Uh, I think a lot of people can make a lot of good living off of, uh, you know, um, hardening up of mobile devices, and they have. Um, a good friend of mine, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with him, uh, Andrew Hu, who wrote the Android Forensics book, uh, now runs a company called Now Secure and used to be primarily mobile forensics. Now they do mobile device security on top of that. So there, there's kind of that whole, that industry that's been popping up for a couple of years because of propagation of spyware and malware on devices. This is the one that really uh, kind of hit hard with a lot of people in the community. Uh, 10 million Android devices reportedly infected with Chinese malware. <laughs> we don't know. And this is this is where we we sit and think, you know, we're immune to this, this will never happen. Think about this. I'm, we're going to think outside the box here for a second. Where are most Android and chipsets manufactured at right now? China, Malaysia, Taiwan, India, we see some chips that are manufactured there. Now think about this. We're not always on the best of relations in the United States with some of those countries. But more importantly than that, they're also being manufactured in factories where the QA controls of those chipsets aren't always number one. And workers that are working in those factories aren't always paid a whole lot of money. And I know this is, this is a different way of thinking about this, but how easy would it be for a government to go into one of those factories, pay off one of those employees, and say, here, put these chips on these devices rather than these chips. We'll give you quite a bit of money every day if you do that. Or, if you do that, you will be uh, nice, nicely compensated by our government, or you're a government employee that's going to work in this factory and do it for us. I'm not attributing that to any country, but I'm just saying it is on the radar of a lot of our three-letter agencies at a very high level. I do know that. It is a concern. It's a legitimate concern. There is a reason that the Pentagon only buys from certain manufacturers, and they are very, very attuned of where those manufacturers and where they're made at. There was a legitimate concern in our intelligence community that this could happen. Has it happened yet? We don't know. But the ability to find or put a hardware back door into these devices is not as we thought it would be 10 years ago. So now you're looking at 10 million devices that could possibly have Chinese malware on it. 
it's such a, a, such a low level that our higher level application scanners aren't picking it up, and it's at such a low level that there's really nothing we can do to bypass it. I mean, there's so many different things that's happening there. Why would a Chinese cyber criminal want to infect 10 million devices? Why not, right? We thought, you know, why would somebody want to infect malware with the Internet of Things device? That's what we were thinking two years ago, right? No, we can be, we can, we can act like, yeah, I knew that was going to happen. Hey, I was thinking, why would we want to infect a thermostat? Why would we want to infect a, an IP camera? What's the benefit of doing that other than taking control of the camera? And then all of a sudden you see these one gigabit, one terabit per second hacks that are literally crippling our DNS service, or at least a good portion of our East Coast DNS service. And then they come out and say that only about 600 devices were involved in that particular uh, DDoS attack. 600, not 6 million, 600 devices generated that amount of traffic. And then they come out and say, well, maybe it was just you know two or three properly configured laptops can really generate about 600 you know, literally 600 megabits per second DDoS attack, which back, you know, you, you know, in the day, you know, that was like unfounded, unheard of. Think about if you can compromise some of these Android phones where you're looking at Snapdragon processors that can really, really do some high processor clocking. Think about the power that you have just running around. So, you know, a person on an LTE network can just, you know, you take control of that device, then all of a sudden you have a mobile DDoS army in, at your fingertips. Very high level, but things to start thinking about. This is going to happen. I'll give you the prophecy since we're on camera. You're going to see this happen at some point. And people are going to be like, well, we never saw that coming. And then I could go back and go into this video and say, yeah, I told you so. I remember 10 years ago I went to this conference and I spoke, and I made the statement that one of the first major acts of, of nuclear cyber warfare will be one country trying to cripple another country's nuclear infrastructure. And there was a guy that literally like laughed at the statement. This is like 2005 or 2006. And he was like, no, we control that a lot more and other countries do that. They're putting a lot of money into this. There's a lot of cyber controls. You're not going to see that happen. About three years later, what happened? Iran's nuclear program got set back because of a simplistic hack of a particular centrifuge device. Stuxnet. Stuxnet. Yeah, you, you're familiar with Stuxnet. Stuxnet was nothing more than reverse engineering some simple centrifuge that was working on a Windows operating system. That was the control module. Yeah. So it wasn't hard to find because, you know, they literally had pictures when the state media went into this underground concrete bunker. They took, they, they did something stupid and took pictures of the inside. So we're looking at it like, no way. That's the reactors? Well, take that to a nuclear engineer. They can tell me what, what's, what, what's running on that particular device. So there's a lot of reasoning of why we would want to infect these particular devices, not just from a criminal perspective, but from a nation-state perspective. Also, there's been this debate back and forth. And, uh, you know, there's I don't think... You have two sides who have arguments on whether they need the data or not. And, you know, that's, this is not a legal class. We're not going to have that argument. We do have a video here that I want to show you of uh, the local news here where they did want to, to weigh in on this topic and, and just kind of talk about, you know, what, what the FBI wanted in this sense. So I'll go ahead and play it for you. Hopefully the sound works okay. begins now. Good evening, I'm Don Hammond. And I'm Jennifer Radney. The encryption battle between Apple and the FBI continues tonight. Just today, Bill Gates decided with the government. He's saying he does not think that Apple unlocking the phone will set a privacy precedent. Just to recap here now, the FBI is wanting to access data and information on an iPhone from one of the San Bernardino terrorists. Our Eric Halperin met with digital forensics experts at Marshall to find out what this could mean for your phone. The two sides of the issue are clear. In a Twitter poll we posted earlier today, 41% of respondents sided with the FBI and 56% sided with Apple. 
But digital forensics experts at Marshall explain how this is a very complex situation. There's these two totally competing, um, diametrically opposed positions that there's no easy answer. And I think they all have, you know, very sound and justifiable reasons why their, their position is correct. John Sammons and Josh Bronte are digital forensics professors at Marshall. Bronte explains in clear terms what Apple would have to do if they need to comply with the FBI's request. They either want a unlimited password reset, which allows them to try an unlimited number of password attempts in order to access that device, or to create a tool that backdoors that device. When you use one of these boxes here at Marshall, after you put your phone in the box, it prevents the device from getting any other signals or communicating with any other devices. Bronte says the biggest difference between the work they do here and what Apple is being asked to do is that they use various bypass methods to pull information from the phone instead of getting directly into it. They're looking at a full-blown, let's tear a hole through the wall. Simmons, who is also a former Huntington police officer, thinks today's law is well behind today's technology. You have devices now that we're trying to apply legal principles to that were written 200 years ago. And regardless of the outcome, neither think this is the last we'll hear of this. It's going to be asked for again. Uh, I don't feel like that this is, this is the first and last request that the FBI will ask Apple. For 13 News, I'm Eric Halpern, working for you in Huntington. By the way, Apple's appeal on the request is due by Friday. Now to ongoing issues involving the... So that's a interesting take, and you know, one of the things that, uh, that, that the, the FBI's position on this is that this was the case, a particular case where we really need that data to move this investigation forward. What kind of data are you going after? We don't know. <laughs> that's that's the argument. Like you don't know what you're going to get until you get on the other side of that wall. So, you know, why do we? And I'm going to go in personal opinion here. But in, in this 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 is a really odd argument. But you know, sometimes you know, tearing a wall down to get to loop the other side of that wall can also create an issue that we cannot reverse. And that that's that can set precedent on, it just really sets a really bad precedent. FBI did ask Apple for this type of data again. Uh, FBI came back a couple of months later and said, we don't need you anymore, Apple. We found a way around this. They did find a private contractor. They threw a couple of million at a, at a private contractor, that private contractor. Uh, did find a way around that particular encryption, uh, which was kind of odd because a lot of people that, that work in this field every day knew that there were probably there was probably a way around it to begin with. Had FBI shared that information with the community or, or put the fillers out for the community, uh, they did find a way around it. And then Apple said, "Hey, we want to know how you got into that, so we can issue a patch for that." And FBI was like. We can't not deal with that. So you kind of saw that die down a little bit here recently. But a lot of manufacturers, they catch up with uh, the manufacturers as they issue updates. We're kind of playing a cat and mouse game trying to figure out how to get data off of these devices. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I'm not getting into the argument side of that. I'm just saying that it's the hacker mentality of me says, okay, harden it down as much as you can. We'll find a way around it. You know, that's uh, maybe that's the best method to get around it in most cases. All right, so I'm going to go ahead uh, for time's sake. Um, we'll uh, yeah, it's 10:50 right now. So what we'll do is uh, we'll just take 10 here before we jump into this. Um, that will give you the ability to take a bathroom break and uh, you kind of get reset. And then we'll get into the whole terms of technology and we'll get into the, the guts of the mobile phone. So, just try try to, to be on about a three on the target here. That way we have some time before the, the end of the conference. That way we're not butting up against the whole last part and then the whole award so I'm gonna give you time to check out the talk. Uh, so I'm going to jump into the terms and technology behind this. So I'm assuming that uh, that some of you are coming in that have done some of this before. Some of you have come in have never, you know, really have, have touched or, or ran through the process of investigating a cell phone before. 
So uh, one of the things is determining what value a SIM card has and what value an SD card has, specifically a micro SD card is what we're up against nowadays. Uh, what passwords might you encounter on the phone? What type of information will the network provider have for you if you're able to obtain such information? Uh, so the first thing is establishing how the networks are connected. So right now we really have, in the United States, we have two specific networks that we, that we deal with in terms of, of how we investigate a phone. The first one being the GSM model, which is the Global System for Mobile Communication. The way that I tell students back at the university to think about this is just think AT&T whenever you hear GSM because AT&T is built upon a GSM network and CDMA which is code division multiple access. I'll break it down what the, the major difference is between the two here. Um, think Verizon in that term. Um, the major difference between these is at a very high level GSM relies on the SIM card, CDMA does not. Uh, CDMA is an older technology, which they both do the same thing. I want you to kind of think in terms of, you know, the VHS versus beta for you guys that were around in the 80s. You guys ever have a beta player? You remember the beta players? I still have an old beta player at the house. You have to load the tape on top, and then VHS came out, and then beta went defunct. And we're like, why did beta go defunct? What was the, the difference? The tapes looked almost the same. But it was like, dude, you got to get a VHS player. It tracks much better than the beta player. Oh, the, the sound is so much better. You know, you can play, and it just auto tracks everything out for you. What? Beta was a much better, higher quality. It was. It was. But everyone jumped to VHS. It was the same thing that happened with Blu-ray and, and HDDVD. What was the difference between the two? Everyone ended up, Blu-ray ended up winning out. And then a lot of people would argue that HD DVD was better, you know, in terms of quality. So it's it's one of those arguments where, you know, basically the reason that VHS won out, he's right, is beta was a much better technology, but they made VHS much cheaper. And then the market started to say it's better because everyone else has one. And then it kind of came to this point that everyone started getting VHS because it was just a better technology. And then it comes down to really, there's not a huge difference between the two. They're both tapes. And nowadays you look at them and well, they both both play crappy on today's standards nowadays. It's like Debian and, and, a, Debian and Ubuntu. They both pretty much foundation, you know, you can you can have a, a, a panel argument of which is better and people would come up with ten reasons why one's better than the other, but they're both Linux, right? So really at the end of the day, GSM and CDMA are really the same thing, and you're finding a lot of phones now, especially on Verizon's network, that do both, because you're having to rely on, you know, connecting to an LTE network. You may have a CDMA phone, which connects to the CDMA network, has a GSM card in it to connect data-wise to a GSM network to download the data. So, you know, just because it's a CDMA phone doesn't mean that you're just not going to have a SIM card. You still might have a SIM card to deal with, but in case of GSM phone, you're going to you're going to have a SIM card. I would say, unless they take physically have taken it out, you can almost 100 percent of the time. But the technologies do the same thing. That's the two networks that you'll see in the states. In Europe, for example, you don't really see a CDMA network because the network wasn't originally built that way. So phones over there are GSM phones, meaning that you're going to encounter a SIM card most of the time. Also, breaking that down, cell phone devices, they have what we call unique serial numbers that identify those. And I'll pass around some of those uh, here shortly. But the phone itself, all the phones that connect to a GSM network, will have one of, will usually be tagged with what we call an IMEI number. That's the International Mobile Equipment Identifier. What that is, is that identifies the handset on the GSM network. The IMEI is, is tagged back to the phone, okay? The phone, it doesn't identify necessarily the customer on the network. It identifies the device on the network. So there's a little different nuance there once you try to wrap your brain around, okay, what do all these numbers mean? On a CDMA network, on the other hand, 
you'll have what's called an MEID, which is Mobile Equipment Identifier. So they both do the same thing. It's a unique serial number that allows them to be whitelisted, blacklisted, or graylisted on a particular network. It used to be back in the day we used to call those electronic serial numbers, ESNs. About 2009, they started to make the transition. So if, you're, if you find an old phone from about 2009, 2010, and you pull you know, an old CDMA like a Verizon phone, you'll find that they had an MEID and an ESN on, under the battery on the phone itself. So older phones had that. Newer phones, you're primarily going to find an MEID number on those. Uh, that MEID number, the neat thing about that is that that can be used as correlation for a specific device. So I'll, I'll show you with some call detail records here shortly. Uh, if you have uh, any type of records that would show you any type of MEIDs, you could tag it back to that specific device. And you could also do lookups on MEIDs to determine what the manufacturer and when that device was manufactured, where um, there's all different kinds of information if you break that down, uh, if you have that number in hand. Also, about SIM cards. So GSM and CDMA phones now will have those, but primarily I'm going to focus in on GSM phones. Uh, the SIM card is really, stand, or at the end of the day, it stands for the uh, subscriber identity module. And what that does is that identifies the subscriber on the network in which they connect to. Uh, you can basically pull that SIM card. You can put it in any phone that you want to uh, in this sense and, and go you know, anywhere in the country. Is, let's just say, for example, this particular phone here, it goes belly up on me today. I can pull the SIM card, go get a little burner phone that I have at home, pop the SIM card in it, and I'm back up and running it. The thing about SIM cards is that if you do request information from the provider, if you're given authority to do that, you can get, based upon the ICC ID, you can pull back uh, subscriber-related info. You can also determine um, a little bit deeper information um, in regards. I'll get to that on the next slide. But they do come in three different sizes. Now, mostly nowadays you're going to see a nano card. Uh, devices have went to this nano module. Uh, I have a bag full of SIM cards here from different uh, manufacturers. They're mainly the standard size SIM card. I use them to practice with in class. But uh, the three different sizes, you can pretty much see that they all have the same size chip on them. This chip has, it, they're, they're really easy to read if you can get a SIM card reader. Uh, but really, they have their own little file system. They use what they call a master file, a dedicated file, and an elementary file. So it almost looks like a registry file when you view these at the structural level. But there's a lot of good information that you can pull from these cards. Specifically on the outside, you'll see on each one of these cards, you'll see a real long number that's printed out on these things. That's what we call the ICC ID number. The ICC ID number is really the identifying number for the, for the card on the particular network. Now, inside of that card, we have another number contained on these, which we call the IMSI number, which is the International Mobile Subscriber Identity. So you have a serial number which can correlate to the card itself, but then you have embedded into these cards, which you can't see on the outside, and I'll pass that around you can kind of see the different manufacturers. That number printed out there is the ICC ID, but the IMSI number on the inside we can tie back to a specific customer. So there, there's a lot of acronyms and numbers to remember there, and each one of those can give us a little bit more uh, information in regards to who the customer, who the manufacturer may be. The easiest way to determine a SIM card manufacturer is to look at the subscriber branding on it. Now, can a SIM be cloned and can information be changed in a SIM card? Absolutely. Does it happen? Not very often you see that happen. Do people take SIM cards out of phones and put into other phones? Yes, all the time. Can we get IMSI numbers that are embedded into those cards if we can get a physical image of the phone? Can we carve out the presence of an IMSI number that was in that phone at one time? Yes, absolutely. So 
keep that in mind down the road that if I'm working with a suspect that's pulling SIM cards and putting in multiple devices, I can determine if they use that particular device by searching for those ICC ID and those IMSI numbers in a physical image and have fairly good success in determining, hey, maybe they were the user of that phone at a certain time. I've had good success with that in the past. But then we'll have to get into a little bit later on how, what levels we got to get to uh, to be able to carve that, that particular information out. Um, I'm a big proponent of SIM card investigations. I think it's very undervalued. I see a lot of law, I work with a lot of law enforcement folks, and I just see them, they'll plug the phone in, they'll acquire the phone, they'll get the data off the phone, and at the end of the day, that's all they're going to look at. And I'm like, hey, pull that SIM card and process that SIM card separately while you're at it if you need to. Uh, you may find that that particular SIM card goes back to a completely different user. Uh, you may have a, another suspect in the mix there uh, just because of the SIM card. Uh, SIM cards also as well, uh, just a little side note, we, we started a project this past summer where we took SIM cards and we just basically submerged them, put them in water, uh, and we put them in a salt water solution, we put them in fresh water, we tried uh, really heavy salt water, we tried half and half salt water, and we just let them sit for like weeks on end. And we pulled them out of the water after about maybe about six or eight weeks, plugged them in to a SIM card reader, acquired them no problem whatsoever. So if you're dealing with waterlogged phones and you're trying to get data back, those things are very, very resilient, more resilient than the phone themselves. Uh, the likelihood of a phone corroding after it's been in water for a couple of days is fairly high, especially in salt water. Uh, the electronics just aren't made to be submersed. Those things have a gold-plated branding, or they're, they're literally gold-plated. A lot of people try to trade them and melt them down with gold. That's just, that's like cool stuff. It would take like $20 million to get enough gold to make any money. But um, you, those things do work well in the water. We had a case one time where they had pulled a, a dead body out of water, and we tried and tried and tried to acquire the cell phone. Could not get anything from that phone because it just it just been in the water too long. I'm like, they're trying to identify the body. You know, you know how bodies are when they're in the water. They they don't really they don't last too long. And uh, they it was like a John Doe identification. So they had this phone. We pulled the SIM, tried to acquire the phone, couldn't get any couldn't get anything to connect. And I was like. Hey, let's pull that SIM card and see what we can get from the SIM card. So I pulled the SIM card, plugged it in, it acquired just fine. I mean, the SIM card looked like the day, it looked like brand new and had no corrosion on it whatsoever. Plugged that in, was able to get the IMSI and the, the reporting phone number, which happened to be the deceased individual. So, you know, little pieces of information like that can sometimes open a case wide open. In this case, you know, put resolve to a missing person slash non jungle case. These numbers here are what I just talked about, those two unique serial numbers, the IMSI and the ICC ID. Uh, what the ICC ID does is that can also contain encoded information about the country and the provider who issued it. So I don't know if you're looking through the bag of the phones or the SIM cards that I passed around, but you notice that there is a branded card in there for Vodafone. The provider can tell you maybe what country that it was from, but they also tag in these ICC ID numbers about the country in which they're issued in, meaning that if you have an individual who's coming in from Spain and an individual who's coming in from Italy, you're going to see in that ICC ID number embedded into that card where that card was possibly issued. We do know. I have some friends at work uh, with uh, CBP uh, that do cell phones all the time. And what they say is that a lot of people, they'll take their phone with them, they'll pull the SIM card when they're here in the States, go over and do whatever in whatever other country that they're doing their business in, use a SIM card while they're over there for that network, and then when they come back through um, customs, they have these phones that have no SIM cards in them. And they act like they're dumb. You know, I don't know why I have this phone. It should have a SIM card in it. And they're like, no. There's a reasoning behind that. So, you know, different networks require different SIM cards. But if you do a, a run across something like that, then you may get a good indication of what country that that that, that, that SIM card is being used in. Uh, the IMSI number can give you customer 
related information. Um, you know, I'd like to say that I've never reverse engineered a, a, a mobile phone provider before to get information, but uh, you wouldn't believe uh, the data that we're getting off of those SIM cards in our classes, unfortunately. Uh, I bought them on eBay. I went out to eBay and I looked at an auction. There was this guy selling like 270 SIM cards for like 14 bucks. I'm like, heck yeah, man, I'm buying those. Like no one else wants them. He's like, you know, you can use them for gold. And that dude's like, yeah, you know, he got taken for, you know, thinking he's going to get gold. And I'm like, no, it, the gold that's on those in the card themselves. We found text messages from older devices where they were storing text messages on the actual SIM cards. We found uh, there was a drug transaction in one of them. And it was like, the, you know, it's just like gold mines of information. We found customer related information. And then we were calling the provider. I don't know if the students were trying to reverse engineer or not. I, that, I don't advocate that in class, by the way. But they did find a lot of information on where those particular devices were, you know, who they were being issued to. The thing about SIMS, though, is uh, there's, there's a little nuance to these things. Uh, you can set a SIM pin on these. Now, this is totally separate from the actual password that you would put on your device. Uh, you rarely run across this anymore, um, but uh, you can, even on these newer iPhones, you can set a SIM uh, pin for these things. Uh, back in the day, what you would do on a lot of older dumb phones, for you guys remember back in the Razor era, you would set your SIM pin to basically be the password for your phone. And that's what a lot of people were doing. Nowadays, a lot of people just do it. So if you run across a SIM pin, there may be some reason that they're doing that. They have to go through some extra steps. You can break these, and the user can change the pin. The provider does not know that pin, so you can't contact the provider and say, hey, I need a pin around this. In order to get around that, you can try three unsuccessful pins before the SIM card locks you out. If the SIM card locks you out after the third successful time, unsuccessful try, it will try to issue, or it will require then a PUT key. The PUT key is a pin unblocking key. So the pin unblocking key is a number that you get from the provider that will allow you back into that card again. So the PUT is not changeable by the user and is known by the network provider. The problem is, after 10 puck attempts, the card becomes permanently disabled. So the crypto chip on that essentially just fries the card after the 10th puck key, and then your SIM card's hosed. So I know that's kind of an old, antiquated, we don't really deal with you know pin and block keys anymore, but you do every once in a while run across a phone that where they may have set a SIM pin for whatever reason. So be careful. Because after you put in that third pin, you have to go back to the provider and get a pin unblocking. And if you're in the private sector and you don't have that luxury to go get a search warrant or contact the provider to get a PUP key, and you're not the customer of that, you're going to have a, a well of a time getting that, that key back. So um, be careful as you're handling these that, that these could be concerns. One of the things about the passwords of the phone, uh, we were talking about this during break. You can lock a handset with a password. That's, that's a given. You can do it either biometrically, you can do it through a swipe password, you can do it through um, you know, just a standard password in general. iOS lets you do from four to six passwords, or four to six characters in your password. You can even use um, a, an actual word as a password if you want to. Um, I've done both. I actually set a, uh, before they went to the the authentication with, you know, you had to use um, six characters for your, or you have to use six numbers now. I went back and used alphanumeric characters and just put in, you know, six numbers as the alphanumeric. So um, there's multiple ways you can set these passwords. All of them store in different places. The Android swipe password, it's not terribly hard to break down, not terribly hard to break. But uh, it does, uh, does require a methodology in order to break that. The problem is, though, if you, re if you seize a phone, let's say you take this phone from me today. Now, right now, I have the ability to log in biometrically into this phone. If I take that 
and the battery goes dead on this, or I shut it down when I seize it, or I take it from an employee or whatever. If that phone starts back up, do I have the luxury of that biometric key again? No. So beware of that. Beware of the issues that you have when you shut down a, pat or a phone that you may lock yourself out of the ability to get into a phone with a certain methodology again. So that's where a decision tree process has to come into play. The next part of this, we're going to get into the whole sources of the mobile device evidence. And that's where these things come from. And I'm going to get a little bit, uh, you know, deep into what, where, what we get from what and what some of this may look like. So in most cases, whenever you're dealing with SIM cards or and phones and backups files of those particular phones, you have a lot of data that you're going to have to put together. So that can come in the form of called phone numbers, um, received calls, missed calls, address books from multiple clients, multiple sources, uh, multiple apps can also have that same address book. Contact lists from multiple sources. We now see where Facebook can load in your contacts from an app. You have the contacts within the app and then over here in your contact book you have the same contacts over here and then jump over into Outlook which no business runs Outlook, right? And then you have this Outlook app that has more contacts in it. So you have a lot of redundancy of contacts, right? That could be a problem. Memos and notes is also going to be a source of evidence. Were those memos and notes backed up? Were, where on the network are those notes and where are they at on the devices? Photographs and pictures, they're loaded with exit data. Location-based data, the time that the picture was taken. All different kinds of stuff can be contained on that. Video. Video is also an incriminating piece of evidence. The problem with mobile phones is they don't always take the best video. Phones are getting better, but the dumber phones, it seems like, you know, the people that catch the incriminating evidence always have the crappiest phone. Have you ever noticed that? It's like, you know, you know, I have this phone here, and it has an excellent video and an excellent camera. If I ever caught a crime, you know, I'm thinking, man, it's going to look good. But everything you see on TV, the video is so compressed and crappy, right? So you're also dealing with codecs and having to, you know, work yourself around those. Voice recordings. We sometimes don't dig through voice recordings to see what we can find. Um, you know, that could also be a concern. Um, iPhone, for example, downloads voicemails into individual voice files. So you're, you're having to process those as you would individual voice files. They're just essentially M4A files that you're going to find in a specific folder in a database on your iPhone. Uh, websites, URL addresses. Um, let's just say, you, you know, a Firefox browser is downloaded onto an Android device. You're going to be dealing with that much as you would the Firefox database on a computer. It's a SQLite database. You're going to have to carve through that much like you would any other Firefox database on any other PC. Internet activity history, text messages. Text messages can have different locations. And this is a confusing factor if you're ever working with the tools. Do they consider, a lot of tools, do they consider iMessage to be a text message? Is iMessage a text message? No, I don't consider it to be a text message. I consider it to be more of an instant message. It does not use the SMS protocol in order to send that particular message. So that can be a problem because now you're dealing with iMessage, which is a whole database in it itself on an iPhone. And then over here, you had when iMessage was down, they were sending SMS messages that's in a totally separate database. But they all interweave to each other to make up the little bubbles that we see on the screen. So then you're having to carve two different databases. You're having to decode two different databases to get that data back. There's another challenge to text messages that, that I'll briefly talk about as well, is the whole encoding mechanism in which these devices encode text messages. So, you know, when we process a computer hard drive, we pull the computer hard drive, we plug it into a device, we get the data off, we do keyword searches for that data, and we're done with it. Cell phones are a little bit different because we're dealing with a totally different processor there. You guys are familiar with ARM processors, right? ARM processors manufactured in China. 
They are very notorious of using non-ASCII characters, which is more along the Unicode lines. They also will encode in Little Indian. You guys know what Little Indian is? What's the difference between Big Indian and Little Indian? Okay, see, we, we are going to learn some stuff today. So Big Indian, remember, um, the whole concept of least significant bit. So least significant bit in Big Indian is always going to, let's just say the least significant bit in this text message is here is an S. So we're going to treat these like they're zeros and ones. The least significant bit in a Big Indian encoded text is going to always be at the end. Okay. In Little Indian, the least significant bit is the first character in a binary string, which means that it reads backwards. Not a problem, right, if you know how to do that, but if you're looking at it by hand, it's going to confuse you. So now you have text messages that are encoded in Little Indian. Not a problem. If I know that's Little Indian, I can just set my decoder and go back and decode them. But then you have another piled on top of that, which is a 7-bit, what we call PDU value which is basically the whole concept of bit borrowing. So you now have text messages that are encoded Little Indian because of the processor, and then are encoded 7-bit PDU, which is basically taking an 8-bit binary string and borrowing a bit from the next binary string after that. So meaning that you have ones and zeros that are borrowed from each particular location in order to construct these text messages because, you know, Text messages is limited to 160 characters. And you ever wondered why it was limited to 160 characters? It all goes back to that concept of PDU. So what they're trying to do in a 7-bit PDU, someone came up with the idea that we can send 160 characters by bit borrowing and compress it down to 140 characters and put less strain on the network. How am I going to decode that by hand? You're not. It's not going to happen you're going to have to find some type of program, a protocol decoder, like Celebrite or XRY, or a program that will know how to handle that information to decode those text messages for you. So now you know the importance of going to specialized cell phone training on top of what I'm just talking about today. If you talk anything that tells you, hey, I need to get a little bit deeper into the weeds on this because if I need to decode that one text message, that may be central to my investigation, I'm going to need to know what to do with it. And if I have to go testify in court on that, I need to know what that product's going to do, even if it decodes it automatically. So that's another thing we'll talk about in the seizure process as well. So all of that evidence there, I know it was a kind of a digression there, but I hope that, you know you kind of you know hit the point there that this is not just as easy as plugging in the phone, acquiring the phone, getting the data, reading it, hand carving out messages and going back. Uh, at the end of the day. There's also little little things about different manufacturers. Is HTC's version of Android the same as Samsung's version of Android? No, not at all. Um, there used to be back in the day, I remember, Samsung, I believe it was Samsung, in their text message, their SMS strings, at the end of every SMS string, I don't know if you guys are processing the phone, they used to put the word dead beef in ASCII at the end of every single text string. So the easy way to determine, okay, where are my deleted text messages there, you just do an ASCII string search for dead beef, and you can probably get most of your text messages back. Was it the best method? But you couldn't find that on a lot of other phone manufacturers because it was specific to that particular phone manufacturer. So it didn't always, wasn't a telltale thing. So now you're dealing with different flavors of Android per manufacturer. It's, it's an uphill challenge. Mobile phone forensics is like the moving target of moving targets. It really is. It's a, it's a challenge in of itself. But I want to break down where the seven sources of evidence come from. And these seven sources are places that you would want to look and you would want to dig for evidence from. First and foremost, the device handset memory, the embedded chips in the phone. The challenge to getting into that level of memory is getting access to physically to the phone itself. Usually, whether it be through an encryption mechanism or just the cables just being finicky and not recognizing. If you can't get into a cable acquisition, then you're going to have to look at a more advanced acquisition like a JTAG or a chip off, which involves either tagging into the phone, JTAGging into the phone, 
to extract the information out of the JTAGs or literally removing the chip from the phone and using a reader to get a binary image of that particular phone. The problem even with chip chip off analysis and JTAG is if you can get an image, you're now stuck with this dot binary image or this massive binary image that now needs encoding. That goes back to the original you know, argument that I was talking about earlier with the 7-bit PDU, Little Indian versus Big Indian. You have at certain databases, they'll encode in ASCII, which is great for us English-speaking folks. And then you look at the different part of the database, and it starts using Unicode. If you don't know how that's broken down, you can confuse yourself really quickly. So it's not like just viewing regular files in operating system. The next thing is the removable media the micro SD card. And I'm going to stop here and uh, I'm going to go through. What I did is uh, I have a had an Android tablet floating around here somewhere. Um, so this particular tablet here, we have quite a few of these that we use as training uh, to kind of like see the devices at Marshall. And this particular tablet's running, it's a Galaxy Tab 4 and it's running, um, I believe it's Android 4.4. We didn't upgrade it to 5. So, but the problem with this is, do we treat this like a phone? Yeah, it has everything on it except the phone. It doesn't send text messages, but I can download a text message app pretty quickly. I can't make voice calls on it through CDMA network or GSM. I can download Skype and make calls through Skype. It has a password on it, but let's just say that this is one of the place, you know, that, that's just one little piece of evidence. If I can't get past the password, and or if I can't get the cable to recognize, is there any other place I can look for evidence on this phone? So then I look on the side there, and I, I can find that there's a slot for a micro SD card. Now, is there the likelihood that a particular device like this could put data on a micro SD card? Yes, absolutely. So I pulled the card out of this, and I just plugged it into a card reader. Let's just see what we have here. So let's go into Finder, and I just plugged it in, and I look under the system partition. I see some config text for the actual system itself. Presenter mode, I think. Am I in presenter mode? Oh, let's put that. Let's get rid of that. I'm going to have to end the show here. Bear with me. PowerPoint save. So I have a system partition here. Just plugged in. has a lot of the um, configurations to boot this. Um, also have a couple of boot partitions, uh, which is binary partition. Bootloader on it. Um, these are partitions that I put on here, bootloaders, to uh, actually acquire the device physically. And I'll get to the, the bootloader process and how we uh, install bootloaders on phones here shortly. But actually on the uh, system partition, notice here that the device images were clearly on this particular card. So in the case of Android, I could fight all day to try to acquire this particular phone, but if I can get a hold of an SD card that has been in this device at one time, I don't need any advanced forensic procedures to go in and just extract the pictures from this, and that may be all I need. In this case, well, we want to look for evidence of drug activity. Well, there's your evidence of drug activity, right? So we make it sometimes harder than it actually is, but there may be need to get in here to get this stuff off the devices. When I worked uh, work in the lab, we'd always get these evidence submission forms. And, uh, you know, the problem is with these, you know, it's there can be so much evidence because people send so many text messages, they make so many calls. And the officer would submit and would put any and all related evidence. I had no background in this case. And I'm like, what? what do you want? And then you would start asking and be like, what, what do you really need off of this? Well, we're trying to prosecute them for a drug case. Well, do I really need to process this entire phone? We're on a six-month backlog at this time, right? 
So think about ways you can make your job a little bit easier of getting the data that you need to get rather than trying to fight with the device. Another thing, uh, I know it's really popular in labs right now to do chip off and JTAG analysis, but you're looking at a couple of hours even for a good analyst to do a chip off. That could, does the need to do chip off just to get images, do you need to do that when you can pull the SD card and get the images back as is? You can see here that all the images taken on this particular device got offloaded into the SIM card. They set up no encryption on this particular card. So, you know, you can encrypt these, you can control these through passwords and whatnot, but a lot of people don't. You know, a lot of users just want to up their memory, so they plug it in there really quickly. There's a whole folder full of stuff. You know, I mean, you can see that very easily this is not anything advanced I have to do here to pull this kind of stuff back. So your SD card can be very uh, beneficial in uh, pulling your evidence back. Bring this back. So any removable media, iPhones, they don't really have that per se. You don't really have removable media. That's, the, that's one of the, the pros of Androids. Most people have an add-on SIM card or an, or an SD card, not SD card, SD card, that, that they do use you know, every day in that. If you ever have some time, pull your own SD card and just view it and see what's on there. Um, I would highly recommend it uh, from a security perspective. If you have employees, have, you know, if you're deploying Android phones you know, from a large scale, look at how you control those SD cards because a lot of proprietary stuff and stuff that you may not want other people to see in plain text gets offloaded in these. So see what, look look at that from a card reader and see what you're looking at. You might be surprised of, of what, what might be dumping onto these particular cards. We process those as we would any other hard drive. So any other solid state drive, we just process it as is. Um, Another place we can get is do just documentation. Uh, if you're seizing a phone, whether it be from an office or a home, get things like phone bills, manuals, packaging, etc. If any, if you have access to that particular user's account, you can get any kind of it, any type of maybe the detailed calls that they made. I know that that AT and T sends me a link to my bill every month, and if I'm able to get that bill and look at the PDF, it shows every single text message I've sent. It's a very detailed, all detail record. Uh, some people still have those mailed to their home, believe it or not. So you may have, be in a situation where in a particular office, somebody may have that tucked into their office, you know, so you just never know. Packaging is another concern. I've seen where IMEI numbers, where SIM pens, IMSI numbers that you would have to dig into the card to get have been like stickered right on the outside of the package of the phone when they bought it. The provider is notorious about doing that. So you may want to seize any kind of packaging. Cabling is also another issue. Uh, if you do have a phone, try to take the original cable with it. Do uh, you guys you know about the, the, the Samsung Galaxies blowing up, right? You know, that was the big thing and blowing up in their pocket. You know they've attributed what could possibly be the issue with that now? Have you read that in the media? It was because people were using older charging cables from their older devices that weren't gauged properly and didn't have the right voltage regulation and was just overloading the battery and causing it to explode. Well, was that Samsung's fault or the user's fault? I don't know. You'd probably be, you'd have to look into the fine details. So be careful if you're, if you're doing these type of acquisitions take the original cable, and I'm telling people that are doing this, especially on Celebrites now, you know, don't, don't rely on, you know, some other third-party cable to do that because you may explode your own phone nowadays. Uh, I've, I don't know if I've heard any horror stories where someone has been investigating the phone. And just, I'm sure it's happened and they've been very hush-hush about it. But, uh, you know, you don't want to put yourself in exploding your own evidence. So, cable, keeping original cabling and consistent cabling, you can plug in original cables into these devices. So you're not limited to using those little short cell right cables that they, that they send to you. Uh, also, 
any kind of cellular network or third-party providers. Now, I know this is a, a law enforcement thing, but you can send legal procedure to get data from a third-party provider or a cellular network. Uh, I'm going to show you the process of a call detail record. I don't know if you're familiar with call detail records, but call detail records are a mechanism that we use in law enforcement to um, look at the location of an individual of where essentially they may have been. And a couple of weeks ago, I, I helped process a case, and I was using, I was telling Norm over there, he, he works at NW3C. Um, uh, just, you care if we, uh, we'll just shameless plug, right? Um, NW3C is a good organization. I'll, I'm going to go ahead and, and I'll put this on camera here. Uh, they have a lot of good specialized training if you can uh, get, you know, sponsorship in to get registered for the training. I know a lot of it is, is essentially law enforcement only and, and I don't know, do they still have a lot of those controls in place about articulations with law enforcement? And yeah, it's all dependent on the grant. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, I know that we, through the university, we have partnered with the West Virginia State Police through an MOU, and then we signed an MOU with uh, NW3C. So, you know, you can work in partnership with those and kind of be, you know, a, a team player and can and get in the training that way. But they do have tools. They do have training. They have a, a CPSA course that you can take. Um, there are also tools that you can get access to to help process these. And I'm not going to talk about tools in general, but I just want to show you how call detail records uh, can be processed. So in call detail records, normally they will send location-based info. You can take that location-based info, you can map it, and within those mappings you can uh, pretty much bring it into other third-party applications like Google Earth and map a certain amount of uh, location-based information. So um, one of the things that, uh, yeah, I'll get into that a little bit later uh, about the actual call detail records, but uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. First place that you could also look as well as a subscriber or other person how could you tie a phone to a specific subscriber that may not be your suspect in question? I talked about this earlier. The number on the uh, card? Yeah, so if you can dig out the IMSI number on the card, then you can get more detailed information on who the customer and who the owner of that phone might be. Uh, I found that you know to be very beneficial. You know, especially in devices like the whole, even if you're working in private side with a bring your own device, if you, if for some way you can tie that back to a user, a good indication, okay, this is a person we need to talk to because this is the person who is bringing in this tablet, this, you know, whatever the case may be, and then, you know, doing some really crazy stuff on their network. So, IMSI numbers inside of those cards. Uh, any kind of documentation that ties it back to that specific phone, any kind of cell records or anything like that. Also, any computers that that device may have plugged into and or synced up with. Uh, what do we know about Android backup services in iCloud? iCloud is very notorious about downloading and, and backing up large numbers of information. Um, you know, ask any star over the past year uh, that's had the nude pictures hacked and thrown out online. It's an issue. And weak passwords for iCloud, uh, poor security mechanisms that are put in place, plugging the phone into a computer and getting a, a backup in iTunes and not encrypting that backup, that can be a concern. Uh, there's been many cases before where I've been locked out of the iPhone. I've been locked out of the Android device, but I've had the laptop or the PC in question and have processed the backup files from iTunes and get all the data from the phone. Entire text message backups, photo backups, app backups, SQLite databases of everyone they communicate with. And you're not just limited to those databases as well. You're also looking at, at third-party apps like Words with Friends. I had a case where Words with Friends was uh, an app in question, where a guy was communicating with an underage girl through the chat messaging in Words with Friends. So I had to dig out all the text messages in Words with Friends and then decode them and put them in a report. And I'm like, you got to be serious. 
And then there was like, hey, here's my cell phone number, text me. And then you had to like jump back over into the text messages to, to finish out, you know, the, the dirty deeds there. It's, it's, it's really odd, you know, how to put this stuff together. The first place you can look, though, is as far as, you know, breaking this down, and, and I'm going to quickly go through those because I've already been through these, is just the, the memory in general. And the problem with phone memory is everything is embedded into the device. So if you can't acquire that through a cable mechanism, then you're having to do the more chip-off level analysis. So there's a couple of companies that, that would advocate to, to go see early training from. Uh, Tiltec is a pretty decent com uh, company to do this from. They do a lot of chip-off and JTAG. Um, there's a lot of other third-party vendors, um, you know, a lot of uh, government-sponsored agency or training facilities that will also offer chip-off and, and, and JTAG for the forensics training on top of that. Uh, it's been quite a few years since I've been to a JTAG or chip-off. I went to chip-off years and years ago um, to do like flash, flasher box-based forensics, which is it's kind of cool in itself, but it's kind of become an antique. You know, the, the flasher box I have uh, really just doesn't do, it doesn't really do anything. You probably reverse engineer it and, and acquire some older dumber phones, but uh, you can't uh, do much with those anymore. But there's so many things that, that is layered in that, that actual device memory. The OS, the applications running upon it, the file system of the phone. And we'll talk about the acquisition of how we acquire those uh, later today. The SIM card, I passed around the SIM card, but saved inside the SIM card, it does have what I call a master file system. So if you ever plug a SIM card into a, uh, a reader, what you're going to find is you're going to find a fi a, just a rudimentary file system. And some of the values that are in there is what we call LDN, the last dialed numbers. You can look and see what last numbers that were dialed on that SIM card. If they offloaded any text messages, rarely you'll find that anymore, but they can be in there. Uh, any kind of like phone books, people used to back up their phone books, but not so much anymore. But they still include that legacy option in there. And some of the dumber phones, the, the burner phones, believe it or not, may have some phone book data in it. You can always get the ICC ID number off of that, which is the serial number of the SIM card. It's contained within the SIM card itself, but you also see it printed on the outside of the SIM card. So that's really pretty easy to obtain. But one of the values that I find very useful, there is a what we call an EF, it's an elementary file, EF-loci information, which is the last cell tower that it connected to before shutdown. I found this to be very useful, especially in cases where people have gone missing, the phone has died. Um, so a couple of years ago, we had a, a missing, it was a missing person's case, it was helping them along in that and they couldn't find they found the guy's car but they couldn't find the guy and so we we got his call detail records we looked and the device drops off the network at a certain time and it drops off like near a riverbank so i'm like okay he's either been killed and he's been dumped in the river or someone threw his cell phone in the river so long story short the guy's body wash washes up on shore the cell phone is a wash. You can't, we, we tried drying it out and getting data from it. Um, but when they were proving the case, um, apparently he got pushed off the bridge. And when he got, he, they were on a bridge, I don't know, it, there was a lot of specifics of the case. But when the device actually hit the water, it, it powered itself down. And we, we were able to pull that last cell tower, tower that loci information, to determine that's where they were at when that cell phone shut down. So it wasn't any circumstantial, they went here, and then they went here, and then they went here. So for like missing persons cases, these things are excellent. They're sometimes keep in mind though, uh, with the last cell tower connected, it doesn't always update that properly. But my whole postulation before they found the body was like, he either jumped and he fell into the river, or he's in the river. And it turned out to be right. So they focused in on that, that particular area. Had another suicide where they, they couldn't trace this guy's cell phone. They found the body. Uh, he tried to jump off a bridge and hit the bridge beam, and he had a phone in his hand, and the phone fell into the river, but his body was on the bridge. So it fell off the network as well. Uh, they ended up finding the phone, and the loci information upon shutdown 
you know, gave a good indication of where that device was when it shut down. That gets your mind thinking, thinking, you know, what about like kidnapping cases, you know, where, you know, someone is, is killed or, and then the car is taken or whatever. You can find so much information from that, just from that one little piece of evidence. It's, it's give or take sometimes of whether it will be there or not. So, also another thing I want to mention is uh, the data can usually be solely on this or both. But the thing about this, do not, if you have a phone, if I take the SIM card out of this phone, it's going to start screaming to put a SIM card back into it. And if you have a device that is put into your possession where you don't have a SIM card, don't put any SIM card in this. Don't just pull the SIM card out of there and throw it back in there. The problem is with that, it will either alter and or delete phone data because of virtue of that card. So we do a process in which we create a forensic SIM. And that's what I would always recommend doing. Create a forensic SIM card which all, does not alter some of the values like the ICC ID or the IMSI. It basically dummies those values out. So you're not overriding data that may be of evidentiary value if, for whatever reason, your suspect has pulled that card out at some point. So the process of doing that, just keep in mind. I know a lot, you know, the bad habits of cell phone forensics is I can't get into that device and pop a SIM card in. Let me go pull a SIM card out of my old device and put it in there so it will stop screaming at me. Keep in mind, look at the process of creating forensic signals. It's a, it's, a, it's a sound process. Do we do that a lot nowadays? If we don't have a SIM card, yes, we do. Uh, so it still is, is a valid procedure in the world of mobile forensics. Can we acquire a phone without a SIM card? In most of the cases, we can. Uh, but the phone's powered up. Just be care careful about that. Here's the thing about SIM cards. Um, the problem with this, and I've given you four shots here of this one SIM card. So I have the front of the device. What's that right there? What is that? This is the back of the device. That's the battery view. This is the SIM card. What has been removed to get to that SIM card? Battery. battery. There's a decision tree process here. Do I need the SIM card information that bad as if to pull the battery from the phone and shut down the phone? So that's where you have to start determining What's the lesser of two evils here? Do I shut down the phone to get the SIM card and process it first, or do I acquire the phone first with the SIM card in it, then after I have the phone data, do I shut that down, pull the battery, and then pull the SIM card and see if I can get any extra info from that? So there's a lot of different things that we're going to have to take into account when we're acquiring these. It's not about technical aptitude here. It's about process. What gets us the most data and what part in this decision tree is like playing the right game, basically. It's kind of like those old books you used to read as a, when you were a kid. You know, you'd turn a page or whatever and to get an alternate ending. That's kind of what cell phone forensics is. If you make like one wrong move, you could lose a good crap load of data, but you're still going to get data back, right? So here's the things about iOS as well I want to bring up. So... This is a phone that I just pulled, we just pulled a SIM card from, you'll get screaming back at you, no SIM card installed. But in iOS devices, you'll have a SIM card tray, and what they used to do in these, and they still do, is that they print the actual IMSI and or ICC ID number onto the SIM card tray itself. And a lot of examiners, for the longest time, they would take that to heart and just literally write that down. But what's the problem with that? If I broke this, what can I do? Replace the SIM, the SIM card and the SIM card tray, or just the SIM card tray. So any kind of numbers like IMSI or ICC ID that's branded onto these, verify them through the card that, that itself. Don't, don't rely solely on that. But also utilize forensic SIM procedures as well whenever you're working with those types of devices. Another thing that is, is on the radar, and it has been for a number of years, is the dual SIM phone. Uh, we seem to kind of bury our head in the sand and say, well, they don't exist. They do exist, and they do. Um, they are kind of on the market out there. 
what they do is they allow you the ability to switch between multiple subscriber accounts. So you can't have phones that have dual SIMs in them. This is a watch, for example, that has two SIM cards. Here is a phone here that has two SIM cards under the battery that you can pop in there. So you know you may have a phone that has that can live on two different networks not at one time, but you can flip back and forth between them. People that travel a lot of other countries, uh, they uh, they find that to be very valuable, so they don't have to pop the SIM, you know, whenever they go into a different network, into a different part of the world. So, um, you may run across something unique like that uh, at some point. The thing about micro SIMs, they're the same thing, you acquire them the same way, there's really no different procedure. The only thing about a micro SIM, though, they're really, really, really tiny, and I think I may have brought a copy of one up, so you, they're really hard to stick into the reader. Um, one of our students around here, I, I ride him pretty heavy. We were uh, acquiring a micro or nano sim in class one day, and he like tries to put it in the card reader, and he just shoves it in there, and it's just like taking, you know, eating your credit card in a credit card reader. It just went down into the box and this abyss and got lost. We had to literally take apart the actual card reader and pull the little tiny. So use adapters. Basically, and that's the same way with micro SD cards. You can lose those real quickly in a reader. But these are identified as such. There's a they call a three form factor and a four four FF. Uh, they just keep getting smaller. I don't think we can get any smaller nano sims, but they all have the same contacts. They're all the same size. So we're just a, it's a size issue basically. Uh, they all read the same and usually have the same structure to them. I'm going to get through this one slide here. Uh, how are we doing on time? Twelve. It's twelve. Okay, so let's let's just go ahead and take a about a ten minute break, bathroom break. Are we supposed to take a lunch in between here at some point? Like twelve to one. Let's, you want to guys want to go ahead and break for lunch? Let's go ahead and break for lunch and then pick back up at what one. So, yeah, we'll pick back up with one get that last cover out of the way. Yes. Yeah, uh, we got the recording going again. Uh, oh, you, you're going to be standing over there. Yeah. So that's why you had it. Okay, just stand where you're going to stand, and I'll put the camera on you. Right here. Good work. Somewhere in that area there. I'll, I'll venture forward. We're going. Good? Yeah, just talk good and loud so you overwhelm the uh, fan. All right. So... Kind of jumping back into this again, uh, I'm going to fire up a couple of things. I know we're, we're on target time to be done by two, so I'm going to kind of go a little bit more quickly and, and not get too much into this. But uh, one of the more valuable pieces, uh, as I showed earlier, is an SD card. You can really get a lot of information from SD card in regards to you know how you know, certain things work. Uh, you can also, if you're dealing with... Um, Large amounts of images or apps. Apps are notorious about offloading a lot of its install onto a card in itself just to save information on the internal memory. So really pulling that and also going back and running that through a forensic program to carve out data that may be on these cards as well is a, is a really important part of this whole process. A lot of mobile examiners, what they'll do is they'll process the phone, they'll process the card, or they'll just re pull the data off of the card and not take a physical image of that card through FTK or NCASE. And the problem is with that is if anything was overwritten on that, you may find some residual data that's kind of lying out there in the unallocated space on these cards. So going more along the forensic, the, the old school forensic processing may be pretty beneficial in staying away from, you know, celebrating other tools like that to, to just do straight up data carving. So if you haven't done any data carving before, I haven't ventured into that whole avenue yet. Uh, probably something we'll bring back next year for the conference, doing straight up data carving, um, putting some presentations together on uh, non-traditional data carving methodologies. And I'll probably bring some stuff in next year uh, along those lines as well, since we know what our... Um... Another thing I talked about was documentation, software, CDs, any kind of driver files are kind of important. Uh, original packaging is another big one. Um, we don't usually go into the manuals a whole lot anymore. You can get those and Google those out. Uh, 
uh, you can find most of the information on the phone from those. Uh, any kind of like uh, adapters or, or you know any type of you know add-on cables or cabling, you can. Would, it's always a good recommended practice if, if those are at the scene or at a desk. Take them. It's better to have them and not use them than to not have them and need them and go back and can't find them again. So here's a, another place that we can get a lot of information from. Now this is primarily one of those thing, tools that law enforcement has used for a number of years, but uh, data info from not just subscriber and billing information, but from call detail records. So say uh, GPS information that logs on the device. Um, one of the things that Apple uh, continues to do, and they had done for a number of years, is they dumped a lot of data into what they call the consolidated DB. Consolidated DB for a number of years before people actually found out what was going on was anytime you would drive by a wireless network, for example, what would happen was, I don't know if you remember back in the old days, you can turn it off now, but uh, it would flash up the available wireless networks that you can connect to, right? Well, what was happening is all of that data was being remembered and then dumped into the consolidated DB. So you had this consolidated DB that just continued to grow and grow and go, grow with latitude and longitudinal location-based data. They still do it to this day to a certain extent. So all of those wireless networks and those locations are remembered and are logged. So if you're ever processing this information down the road, it may come in handy to find out, hey, where was a person based upon the wireless networks that they tried to connect to? Almost guarantee if you're an Apple or Android user and you were around this vicinity this weekend and I were to process your phone, even if you never connected to any of the networks here, the residual artifacts on that phone, I should be able to determine you were in that vicinity based upon the location data that was popped on that phone. So whether you want it to be or not, phones do collect that data by virtue of being on the network. Call detail records is another area that we go to. Mainly to get those back, though, that's going to require a search warrant to the provider. The search warrant to the provider, they'll send you usually either a PDF um, manifest of pages upon pages of files, or if you're lucky, you'll get a, an Excel spreadsheet of just tower information, latitudes and longitudes they have to do a tower. Uh, so I'm going to show you an example where uh, we got call detail records from an Excel spreadsheet. This is from, from a case where we got the call detail records and then I took and decoded the, the call detail records and put them into a Google Earth file. So in that Google Earth file, um, pull it out here real quick. So this, this started out as an Excel spreadsheet and basically went from this and this is a screenshot of that. We're going to skip ahead a couple of slides because virtue of time. But this is plotted data from a call detail record. And this is um, pretty much the whole map of Huntington, West Virginia, just a massive dump. I don't want to get too deep into this just because of the, the content that's in these things. But uh, you can see pretty much data is quite readily available in there. So this is all the calls from about a 20 minute span on an entire tower, one tower in the middle of Huntington on Saturday night. 20 minutes worth. Look at all this plotted data. And that is all the calls that connected, all the calls and texts and data that connected to a tower from a unique telephone number in a 20 minute span to one particular network. It's pretty useful. So, you know, if you're trying to locate an individual time-wise into a certain location, the easiest way to do it is map it out. And KML, KMZ files do an excellent job of doing that if you can take your Excel data and do that. So, a lot of tools will allow you to convert your Excel latitude and longitudes into a KML file. You can plot that data. You can also change these push pins to whatever icon that you want it to be. Google Earth will read that. And now you have outputs in Google Earth. You can either save these images 
or you can interactively pass that off to another individual, or you can go through and look through it yourself. So you can blast these things out, and some of these push pins are multiple calls in the same location. So it's uh, call detail records can be very, very useful uh, from a law enforcement perspective. They are, but you know, you may be involved in a case where. You know, even as a private contractor or as a private employee, you could be working with that law enforcement agency because they're being criminally prosecuted. So I've, I've been in situations like that where, you know, we're working as a law enforcement agency with a, a private entity to, you know, solve you know, some type of, you know, crime that's happened to that particular business. And you can see, you know, here's an output of that particular uh, capture. This is Marshall's campus. And you can see the plotted data there and the time in which they happen. This is a pretty fresh, fresh event too. This is not you know something from ten years ago. It's fairly new. So, also, the old-fashioned way is just to ask questions about the device. One of the things we underscore: we spend too much time trying to figure things out, and sometimes not enough time just social engineering. You social engineer yourself into a lot of these things. Ask people questions: What's the phone number? Who's the subscriber? Who pays the bills? You may get answers like that. Who's the network provider? Is there a password? You may be dealing with an incident where you have you know, full cooperation from that particular person, and you may have a short window in which you have full co cooperation with that particular person. Coming from a law enforcement environment, I will tell you, people are most cooperative when? Common sense will tell you that. When they first what? Get caught, right? It's like they are the most helpful people in the world about the first couple of hours, or maybe the first couple of minutes, and then the reality of it starts to set in. And then you start hearing lawyer, then you start hearing, no, I better not do that. So you have this really small window that you can kind of jump in there with that cooperative, well, I've been caught, I'm going to be model citizen, I'm going to give whatever I can to help the cause of this until I figure out, oh my gosh, I'm screwed. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh my gosh, I need a lawyer to handle this. And then by the time they're going to start pleading fifth and then, you know, moves over to a, a whole law enforcement incident, now you've lost that window of opportunity. So uh, permission is always a good, good thing to have there in, in that term. Also, any computers associated with the phone? Uh, any, any computers that may be this device plugged into at one time. That's an important thing because if they performed any backups, you can get any backups of those devices. In iPhones, that's extremely important because with iPhones and iOS devices, if I plug that into my Mac right now and it'll prompt me to trust or not trust that particular machine, what that will do, if I click on trust, what it will do is it will install a trust certificate onto that machine that certificate basically is a way for me, and they, they generate those a lot, but I could exploit that trust certificate through Celebrite and another tool to crack the password in most cases. So those are pretty golden nuggets of evidence to have on there, and you can try those against your password just to see if they work. Uh, in some cases they do. So that's one way to get around things. Another way is if they've connected to iTunes or iCloud, they can have full backup of that particular device on the computer itself. So the sms.db, the full iMessage backups, the app backups, all could be contained on that PC. You could also have archival content where they backed up to a PC and then they had that old crap moment and they deleted everything off the device and it didn't connect back to iCloud. You could have a full backup of that and you could process this phone all day and find Jack Squad on it and then your backup on a computer that's really low hanging fruit because it's easy in most cases, to, it's easier to crack a Mac than it is to crack a phone. So if I can get around the control, password controls on that Mac, which is really easy to do, boot disk, pulling, God forbid we got to pull the drive out of that thing because of getting into the drive itself. And if you can get the drive off the new ones, because the data is embedded, or you can run it in, uh, you can put it in target disk mode, acquire the data off of it, now you have a full backup of the iPhone. So. There's a lot of things we can do with computers associated with the phone itself. Long story short, very, very useful. The fourth part is really the most sensible part, but it's the most useful part. 
And I think it's a part that we kind of undervalue is the whole seizing of the cell phone. And when we have a lot of data to take, and we know that, that litigation, we're, we're sniffing at litigation down the road, this is the most important part of the process that we so often overlook. This is the part where you can be part of the solution and not part of the problem, believe it or not. One of the things that really this is the backbone of how things are performed down the road. Also, this is a part where you're going to have to ask yourself, how do you properly seize this phone to get it to the point where we can perform an acquisition on it? How do we preserve that data? How do we get to that point? So the first basic steps, number one, is secure the phone. Prevent the phone from being used and capture the information on the display. Now, if I take this phone, let's just say if we have to seize this as part of our investigative process, okay? So there's a lot of inherent vulnerabilities of this phone here. First things first, I got to secure this phone. How would I get this phone off the network? So there's a couple ways to do this. So I can I can either shield it in Faraday. I could, you know, and I have a couple of those that, that I brought in for you guys to. I think I brought it. Yeah, I brought it. So one of the the easiest ways to to shield a device is to put it in a Faraday bag. Uh, one of my favorite Faraday bags to use is these uh, these nice little. Um, window bags that you can put data stuff into. Uh, I think they call these black hole Faraday bags. So the thing about these is you, you put the phone in the bag. When you put the phone in the bag though, you can seal it back and I'll, let, I'll pass this around so you guys can kind of see uh, what I'm talking about. But inside of this bag it's like a copper mesh and what that will do is that'll block any signal from, from leaving out of the bag. Now What's the problem if I seal this thing up? What do you think is going to happen to the power on this phone after a certain period of time? So it's shielded now. And you can see it'll finally kill itself off where it has zero stars. It's disconnected itself from the wireless network. What do you think will happen to that device after a couple of minutes? It's at 13% now. It's going to boost its power to try to make a connection. Yeah, so it's really going to ramp up the antenna strength on that, radio strength on that antenna to try to get signal. It's going to kill itself as far as battery power. It's going to shut itself down. Do we have a new iPhone with us here? Well, mine's not new. It's... Anyone have the current iPhone? You do? On the 7? Yeah, it's one of the new, new ones. Supposedly they get out even through the bags. Really, it was telling Well, you. be careful so. about this. So there's a couple of little nuances to this. If you run a cable, so what a lot of examiners will do, they'll say, well, I'll just run a cable and like snake it out of the bag where the phone is shielded. Be careful about that because it'll act as an antenna and it'll feed the data out. So I've, I've literally looked inside of those bags and you have like two bars and you're like, oh, two bars. We did some benchmark testing a couple of years ago down at Marshall and found that by running an antenna out, yes, it does still get signal. So be careful about running cable in there. So you have that window when you seize it and put it in the bag to the point that you can acquire it. If you acquire it, you're really the, the, the likelihood of keeping it shielded in that mechanism is not as high as it was because you've acquired the data. But if you don't shield it, what happens? What's, what, what's a drawback to not shielding a device when you seize it. They were remote wiping. To give you a horror story. So I had a, a student assistant. We were running the lab and we had a, a phone that was mailed to us in US mail. The student's coming he comes running into the lab with like this box held out like like it's gonna blow up and I'm like, oh my gosh, he's gonna blow us up. He has a ticking time bomb and he's gonna run into the lab and it's gonna blow us up. So he runs in, and he's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, and, and he sets it down, and it is a box, but it's ringing. And I'm like, whoa, this is evidence. I mean, this package is evidence. And we open it up, and someone had taken a phone, and they had just bubble wrapped it. No shielding whatsoever, and it was taking calls. It was taking calls. Now, it was one of those dumb phones, so it only had slots for 100 calls to be made. And I guess this, this dude's mom was just going frantic. Like trying to get a hold of him because he's you know he's locked up in jail right and and yeah, I don't remember if it was a suspect or the victim's number no it was a suspect's number 
So the victim's suspect's mom is just calling like crazy. So we go through and we process the phone to find nothing. Nothing on the phone. The investigator says, man, I looked through the phone before I submitted it. I knew there were text messages on it. I knew there were call logs. Look again. I'm like, dude, we looked. It's not on there. It's like, well, we'll just take it to another department then. You guys aren't doing your job. I'm like, dude, you're not doing your job. I'm not shielding the device. So, come to find out, the guy got arrested, went to jail. And what do you think his one phone call out was? Well, hello, AT&T. How are you doing? Uh, I seem to have lost my phone. Could you, you know, is there anything you can do to help me out with that? Well, sure. Well, let's go ahead and issue a remote wipe command. As soon as it touches the network, we'll go ahead and issue that. It'll wipe all your contacts off your phone. If you find it, you know, we can, you know, take it to a local AT&T store. We can, you know, get stuff back. But, you know, at least your data will be safe. Wipe everything from that device. iCloud gives you the ability to wipe remotely now. So you don't even have to call the provider to do that. So if I can get to a computer where I can wipe that device, I'm going to scrub that device clean. Even if I'm a criminal, I'm going to do that. So make sure you shield that until the point you get it to acquisition. Now there's a, a soft spot when you, when you shield, the, shield these things. Those bags can get expensive. And size-wise, it's really hard to fit a tablet like this into a bag. So they make bags of different sizes. Uh, the company that the... Uh, the the shielding bag I passed around, they make a black hole Faraday bag. It's a really big bag that has a pass-through cable that you can buy, or a pass-through cable built in that supposedly doesn't let signal get out, uh, so you can use that. My favorite, though, is uh, these shielding boxes, which is these guys right here, and basically just a, what we call a Ramsey box, but the Ramsey box is... You know, you can carry this, you can deploy it on site, you have a viewfinder, so if you seize any phones, you can kind of keep that on your desktop. You can see the phone in there, there's a light on the inside that, that lights up, plus you have a USB pass-through that is shielded as well. So you can, run your, you can run your phone, keep power to your phone, plug this in on site, seize all your phones, and then just pick that up. As long as you have some type of uh, UPS backup, you can take that back to your desk and then just process everything inside of this box. So all your phones feed out through this USB connection. You can plug it into your Celebrite or whatever you know tool that you're using. It's a good investment. In my opinion, I have, I have two of these, and I, I have two of these at Marshall. It's probably about fifteen hundred bucks, maybe about twelve, fifteen hundred, depending on the manufacturer. But really, these little gloves right here, they're Faraday material as well, so you can pretty much, the hardest part is you know, keeping your hands in there and you know, manipulating the phone through gloves. But it does save, you know, and it does create a good chain of custody in regards to that. Hey, Josh. Yes, you sir. said this is a Faraday bag? Uh, that one should be. Uh, you're getting service. I know. Yeah, I don't know if you guys noticed that. So yeah, it's showing one bar. So I don't know how how validated that is. So keep that. Did you guys catch that? Yeah, it's it's. Uh, is there a tower nearby? It it did no service at one point. But then I just yeah. kind of shifted it, and then it says LG with a bar. Yeah, it's. I, I thought it would eventually update itself, but be careful. You know, that's that's worth. I could I could spend another uh, presentation on uh, tool and uh, equipment validation before you deploy that in a live evidence environment. Make sure that it's doing what it says it's doing. Uh, these things do fail. This one's a couple of years old. I've had this one since like '09. Um, it's been pulled. It's been you know you could have some you know, holes in there or anything that could cause at least a little bit of signal to get out. And these phones are getting stronger, so. Uh, another mechanism you can, you can do as well, I have it out there on the table, you can use arson cans. But beware of the arson cans. There's two different types of arson cans that you can, you can buy. You can buy the lined arson cans or the unlined arson cans. The arson can that I brought that's out there on the table is a lined arson can. And you can tell because it has that gray paint on the inside. What's the problem with that? With the lined arson can? 
If you have a, a metal to non-metal contact, the ability for the signal to leak out of the lid is could be there. So if you're buying these, you can buy them for like three or four bucks on a, in a crime scene supply store. Make sure you get the unlined cans. So a lot of people make the mistake and buy the line cans that the arson investigators use. Get the unlined cans. Uh, that's a cheap way to do it, so that's cheaper than the Faraday bags that you can buy. The even cheaper method is to go down here to Kroger or the Speedway on the corner and get a big package of Reynolds wrap and just wrap the phone about, you know, at least, they say four times, uh, whatever it takes, you know, whatever you're comfortable with. You know, I've, I've had cops bring phones to me that look like, you know, it was Thanksgiving turkey wrapped up. But, you know, better safe than sorry, right? Three dollars worth of Reynolds wrap. That could save your career. So rental, you know, aluminum foil wrapped in a uh, in a phone is another good way of doing that. You can size it up based on. So that's a cheap way. Another thing is to not allow users to operate the phone. Uh, make sure that you're documenting all instances of you operating that phone. So if you want to do a manual scroll through, make sure that you are documenting when you did that. Because if you're calling back in court, if someone touched that phone and you don't have it documented, that's breaking chain of custody, which is a big no-no in the court of law. Also, record any important information that's viewable on the phone's display. If there's a photograph, is, is a queued up text message, even if the password's been, you know, bypassed, you may have a text that's queued up that hasn't been sent yet. And that may be something that's key. A uh, photograph that's been called up. Um, you know, I've, I've seen, you know, where literally phones have been seized and brought that have pictures that are just called up on the screen, you know, that were being viewed at the time they made the arrest. Take that sooner than later because if the phone powers down, then you're losing a lot of that information that gets purged out in memory. Also, if the phone stays connected to the network, all of these things can happen. Things can get deleted. Things can get modified. Phones do chatter with networks. It can take an update. That's another big issue. Uh, anytime you want to get a phone off a network, get the phone off the network. That's a, that's a big, big plus when you're dealing with phones like this. Anytime you have something going out and, and changing itself on a network, that's just not good evidence practice. Anything, anytime we talk about evidence and change, those are two good terms that do not go well together, so keep that in mind. That's the litmus test. If something is changing, then you want to document what that change is. If you're having to install a bootloader on this just to get the physical image, you want to document that change. So change is not awful on a phone, but uh, you want to make sure that you know what's happening to that phone. Here's the, the questions that people ask. When do I turn it off? How do I turn it off? How do I acquire it? There's so many different things here. I can either turn off the phone, I can pull the battery, or I can shut down normally. Or do I keep it powered on? We talked about Faraday blocking, but what if I leave the phone on and turn off the receiver and put it into airplane mode? What's a drawback to that? Especially with iPhones and a lot of newer devices. So what if I decide, okay, I'm just going to put this phone into airplane mode. That'll keep it from touching the network, right? Maybe. What's the problem with putting a device in airplane mode for you Apple users? You can still turn on Wi-Fi in airplane mode. Exactly. So is a, a service like iMessage... Can it still send and receive text messages in airplane mode connected to Wi-Fi? Yes. So people that say just put it in airplane mode, I'm not a big advocate of that for that very reason because if you put a phone in airplane mode, you're only turning off half of the communicating services that may be on that phone. So what I do, like in this case, when I put my phone into airplane mode, I'm still connected to wireless from home. So my phone by default, when I go home, I turn I turn my airplane mode off so I won't take calls, or I turn airplane mode on so I won't take calls, but I can still take messages. So if you were to take my phone and put it in airplane mode, you would run into that issue where I can still accept text messages.
So that's a, a very common occurrence to happen. Uh, you can also, that, that whole kill signal philosophy, if data is changing, then deleted information may be overwritten. You do not want to lose that deleted information by virtue of changing what's on the phone. So the thing is, is if you put it, you know, if you try any kind of like signal jamming, once you can put it into a box, that's the easiest way, the easiest mechanism. Um, I've heard people talk about jamming devices. Uh, they're highly illegal to jam signal. Don't try the jamming signal. It's, it's redundant. It doesn't work well. Um, that's about one of the only greenlit folks that can even run any type of jammers like that is federal law enforcement. It, you're kind of getting into, I think, you know, Title III wiretapping and things like that uh, by running, by virtue of just running those jammers. So um, you can also contact the provider to take the phone off the network, or if you can get access to the SIM card of the device, uh, like on an iPhone, you can get to it from the side. You can take those out. That's not the best mechanism, but you can do something like that to, to make sure it's not chattering with the network. But the best thing to do is just put it into Faraday and then acquire it quickly and then not have to worry about it. Um, the problem with the phone being turned off, if the phone it shuts off at any point, what you may run into is it could set a keyboard lock or a SIM pin. It could turn off biometric control. So if my phone restarts, I can access it biometrically right now. I lose the ability to do that once it goes through a shutdown procedure. Also, there's a lot of things that are stored on the phone that gets purged out just like any other computer. So you could lose the phone's date and time. There's a lot of things in regards to you know apps purging out information that may be in the database. Uh, those write-ahead logs that, that SQLite refers calls to in the database may be purged out because it doesn't need them anymore. So even the databases can be altered on a phone shutdown. So you know, I don't buy the fact, well, if you shut it down, nothing happens. It's not like a computer. No, there's a lot that happens in the background. Uh, that's, a, that's a flawed statement that a lot of law enforcement officers will make. Try to avoid shutting it down until you've acquired it with, like, Celebrite or some tool. That way you can have that information. If you turn the phone off by normal means, you also deregister from the provider's network. Remember we were talking about that loci information in the SIM card? It will update that particular entry as well. So you're changing that by virtue. So you don't want to walk into court and say, oh, shut down my office. You know, you want to, if there's any data there that may be of value to you, you don't want to be the person to override it. There's plenty of ways you can shield that. I've talked about the arson cans. I'm trying to, to push this forward a little bit. The thing about uh, radio frequency is the ability to... Um, you, that whole boosting of, of power output. Also, you don't want to make yourself an external antenna. We've already discussed that. Now, as far as blocking mechanisms is as well, you're looking at different frequency ranges you're going to have to block as well. And one particular phone could have both Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and cell signal, all running in different megahertz ranges. So some signals are stronger than others. Some signals actually have a bigger boost than others. So I'm not a, a, an expert on radios, but I will tell you that you're having to deal with multiple signals being emitted from the same device. So keep that in mind. With the also, with that being said, you can also have multiple networks that they can connect to, multiple Bluetooth devices. So if you're seizing a phone and you walk by the car that that was connected to, it can connect to that car and change data. Also, if they were here at the Holiday Inn at some point, like we all have been, and connected to their guest network, if you go back into Holiday Inn again by just driving by it, you can log some data on there. I've seen that happen. I've seen a lot of officers do that before. They seize the phone, they don't shield it, and it was like, why is this car going here? That It was like it was following the officer, and the officer had the phone up, and it was like logging where they were going as they were bringing it in. I hope they don't call that into question anymore. So, you know, you don't want to be that person that writes the data to there. Also, um, the, the main thing as far as information is concerned is, is there any type of loose removable media that's available for this phone? Was it ever connected to any type of networks? 
is there any additional cabling I can take with this? And are there any old handsets that you might have? The more handsets you might have, the better off you might be at piecing databases together. So let's say if you can get a hold of my old Android phone, you're going to have a better likelihood of getting my exchange password for my email. Or if you can get a hold of a computer or any other device that comes into play, you can also use that to put and go after the low-hanging fruit and then point the low-hanging fruit into cracking those harder devices like the iPhones. So that's, that's a key element there. Also, if, uh, if there's any kind of little things like uh, SIM adapters or anything like that, you know, I know a lot, a lot of people don't like to, to talk about taking these, but let's just say if you're having a tough time getting this SD card to read, and for whatever reason, I've run into this before, uh, could not get an SD card to read. Could not get it to read. I've tried it in my, my, my own card reader. Couldn't get it to read over and over and over and over and over again. Um, ended up, they seized a card reader at the scene with that. I used the suspect's card reader and was able to read the content for the SD card. So I had to document that in court, use the suspect's card reader to read the card from the suspect phone. So there's, there's times like that when maybe having that extra equipment will work out. There's also, if they're running any kind of, if you run across any kind of flasher boxes or anything along those lines, you may be running into a, a, a place where they may be programming their own ROMs and, and you know, things into their own phone. That could suggest a couple of different things. Either you're dealing with a very high level person that knows how to modify phone data because they're flashing their own ROMs onto their phone seize those because you may be required to uh, figure out a little bit later on what was going on. Now this is kind of becoming more antique as, as time moves on, but uh, you can also use these to create flash dumps in your memory possibly. So if you have a phone that's been rooted or jailbroken and you have utilities or any kind of hardware that you've seized a part of that, you could use that to reverse engineer the jailbreak or to reverse engineer the custom ROM that they put on their phone. Very limited number of cases where I've heard of that being done, but it is possible. Also, related documentation, you do run into sometimes you can find a pin and a puck key on those older. Uh, there, there are little snippets of information that you can run into. Uh, that might be on documentation that you can't find anywhere else in the phone that would help you in, your, in the course of your investigation. But the main thing in the whole transportation and storage is to maintain a chain of custody. Now, how do I maintain a chain of custody when seizing a cell phone? What's the easiest way to do that? Documentation. Start a chain of custody log. A lot of people think, well, I'm not law enforcement. I don't need to do this. No, you really need to do this because if I can create a chain of custody log, then by virtue, I, if I ever do have to go to court, I can show that I've used sound evidence processing procedures and that I wasn't being reckless in my processing. So be very diligent when you're going through that. Maintain a chain of custody log. Keep it locked up at all times. Keep it shielded. Even after the course of the investigation, keep it under a shielding mechanism just for safekeeping. That way you can document to say, you know, even in the course of the investigation, I kept this shielded from the network via Faraday blocking mechanism. I also maintain chain of custody, so when I send it to so-and-so lab, they signed it over, I got it back three days later, I documented that in my chain of custody. It was in storage in our secure sto storage facility from October 8th to December 8th, and I'm testifying on December 20th. You know, it, it's that timeline that you want to maintain. Also, um, if you're dealing with, and a lot of people say this, but um, if you're storing the phone, there's a couple of ways, and, and I don't advocate or de-advocate either way, but uh, sometimes if a phone stays off of the network for too long, Nokia's were really, really notorious about this, they will reset the time to just a zero time stamp if they're off the network long enough. So know your phone. Know what the phone's mechanism does if, if the phone ever does go dead. So do you want to keep it off? If it's off, do you want to keep it charged or do you want to keep it charging? 
So it depends on how long this is going to be in litigation and how you're going to maintain that phone. If you're working for an agency, follow all the procedures for proper handling. If you don't have a handling procedure, you may want to make one. Because if you go to a criminal court, what am I going to challenge you on first thing? Think about this. If I'm doing any services where I'm extracting information from that phone, where am I going to challenge you on? Your procedures, right? If you don't have a procedure in place about how you do cell phone forensics, and you're doing cell phone forensics, you're just a vigilante to me. You really are. You have no idea what you're doing. You're just doing whatever you want to that phone. That's what an attorney's going to say. If you don't have sound procedures in place to suggest, okay, this is what I'm doing, then you may run into those issues. Where do you get those procedures from? So I'll go back through that here in just a second. Um, procedures you can get, uh, best practices from SWGDE, so SWGDE.org, that's the Scientific Working Group on Digital Evidence. Uh, there is a NIST uh, publication uh, that's out there as well that exists for people that are just getting into the field. Um, a place to start reading that from, and I'll... So SWGDE, they have their best practices documents that exist out there. Oh. So they have how, what do they consider to be a best practice? They have everything from handling evidence to equipment prep to acquisition to documentation. It's very simplistic information, but uh, it's a good starting point to acquaint yourself with. Also, they have um, processes in place in regards to... Um, core competencies for mobile phone forensics. So all these documents are publicly available online, but they go into how, what do they recommend for a core competency for a first responder? If you have first responders in your company and they're seizing phones, I would suggest that you make sure that they meet those core competencies and you've had some kind of internal training with, a, say if you pick up a student assistant, that they've had a little bit of training on this. I could go today, even after today, and say, you know what, I've, I've set through a training on mobile phone forensics and the seizure of mobile phones. I could pretty much prove that I meet that core competency for a first responder. Or if I've taken some type of like phone seizure certification or something that would suggest I met that benchmark. If I'm a level two for a first responder, they have core competencies for lab personnel which basically means that they know how to do manual, logical, hex dump analysis, and memory card and handset processing. So this is where specialized training comes into place, where you would go through like Celebrite or you know some vendor level certification to learn your tool. And then when you're setting in the court of law, you can say, here's the core competencies that Swigby identified. I went, evaluated myself against those core competencies and certified myself and accredited our laboratory against those competencies. So this can basically be the, the mechanism that survives you in court. If you're following sound evidence procedures, this is something that's, that's not new to law enforcement. Law enforcement's been doing this for umpteen years because when you're going into a court of law, you're going in front of an attorney and that's where they really challenge. They challenge your methodology. The Scientific Working Group of it, on Digital Evidence is a group I've been involved in for a number of years, uh, both as a practitioner and an academician. And I'll tell you, you know, as basic as these documents are, they're really good starting points to set your standards off of, uh, to set your SOPs off of, and to look at, you know, quality documents and stuff like that. The other document that I talked about to, to begin with um, NIST publishes uh, an 800.101 file, which is the Guidelines on Mobile Device Forensics. That's a publicly available document. Uh, Rick Ayers and, and Wayne Jansen, they're both tied with NIST. The Sam Brothers works for uh, Customs and Border Patrol. Um, so they uh, have basically put a document together on tools, preservation, acquisition, examination and the reporting of mobile phone evidence, what they consider to be the baseline competencies for that. So this is as, as basic as it is, it's a good document to go through and acquaint yourself with. 
Because when you're sitting in a court, even in a civil or a criminal case, you're going to be challenged based upon your know-how, your methodology, and are you processing the same way that other people are processing these phones in the field? And if you have no clue about how this methodology works, you're going to have a tough time, and you're going to be disqualified as an expert. And if you're disqualified as an expert, it's not your company that takes the fall. You take the fall. So keep that in mind. You know, when you're, when you're up on the stand, you are qualifying as the expert. When you go to the Dauber Challenge, you are the expert, not your lab, you. That's your personal reputation. And I hate to say this, but you know, when I was up on the stand going through a Dauber Challenge to a judge or an attorney, I could care less about you know lab standards or whatnot. It's all on me at that point. I use my lab standards, I use my SOPs, but at this point, it's about getting me through because this is what pays the bills. This is what feeds the mouths. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, this is what we get paid to do. And we want to keep make sure that we maintain that that level of professionalism and integrity. So uh, that's a really important place to start. All these controls, uh, it all comes down to as well. How do we transport this stuff? Uh, if you remember the OJ case, uh, the big issue with the OJ case is was transportation of evidence. They were putting stuff in a trunk and then going back in the house, leaving it unattended. Cameras focused right in on that trunk. So when they took the case to court and they started looking at that particular case, they had this video evidence that says that evidence was unattended. How do you know that evidence was a change when you went back in the house and searched for more? Whoa, don't know that. So. Be mindful of how you're transporting and you're storing that evidence because even in storage and transit, you're dealing with evidence that if you hit a really hard speed bump in your trunk, what do you think could happen to a mobile phone? Wireless routers. You ever had dropped a wireless router before? And then you pick it back up and you plug it back up and it's lost all of its settings. Flash-based memory. That's the nuances of flash-based memory, so it can happen. So be mindful. Heat is not good. Bumps are not good. Uh, having things not locked up is not good. So transportation can be even be an issue. Uh, also, as far as storage is concerned as well, don't put it in a place that's going to leak. Don't put it in a place that's going to overheat. You know, that's simple server room mechanics there, right? You don't want to put it in a place where uh, if a tile, ceiling tile starts leaking and it leaks onto your evidence, you're going to be in trouble. So, you know, even those little things you have to think about. And is it going into a locked place where only you know that you have access to it? So, you know, treat, even if you're a one-man show doing this as a one-man unit, treat it as if you're, every case that you work is going to go to the court of law. That's the way I would do it. I would... I would build a quality system, even if you're the only person doing it. When I started in 2005, and they said, okay, you're going to start processing mobile phones. Okay, and then I started thinking, I don't have no idea what I'm doing here, but I'm going to find out people who do it. So I started contacting people. I got my SOPs. I got my quality documents. I started buying and procuring equipment. I got put myself and, and, and built everything out. I tested it. I established it. And then when I felt comfortable that all my methodology was good, then I started taking cases. And then I started processing cases. And then I got to the point where I'm like, well, now it's time to hire someone. So then you hire someone, and uh, you know they start doing it. But uh, we built a quality system around that whole procedure. But we, we treated every single piece of evidence as if it were going to be challenged in court. And that's part of a, what we call a laboratory quality system. Also, when we get to that point of analysis, uh, I know we're getting close to the 2 o'clock mark, so we have about six minutes, so I'm about where I want to be at this point. So if you're an expert examiner, this is the point where you want to make the determination, do I want to stop here or do I want to continue? Because this is where I want to get you today. Do I want to go beyond this and train myself of how to extract this information off of these devices? So there's a couple of ways to do it. You can either, the easiest way is the manual scroll analysis, which is uh, the best piece of software that you can ever buy is uh, from uh, Two Thumbs Incorporated, which is pretty much 
just going through and scrolling through every menu, taking a picture of every menu, and uh, documenting that in a report. There's a couple of good pieces of software that do that. Uh, Fernico, I believe, makes a ZRT module that lets you take pictures and put that over to a uh, reporting format. There's, there's a lot of tools that do that. Celebrite now has a camera mechanism. You can attach a camera and take pictures of it. Vendors have a lot of tools in that. Uh, the best tool that we found to do that is called uh, Graduate Assistant, or uh, Student Assistant. Uh, we, we have a bunch of those at Marshall, and we send them over to the, the, the state police lab, and that's what they do. They're like, what do you do for two years? Well, manually scroll through the phone while the other examiners do the logical and physical analysis. So if you do have student assistants that need real-life casework experience, there you go. Manual analysis is a good place to start. Uh, you can train them on that. The le next level of that is logical analysis. And I'll go over here. Logical analysis is only the files that are on the phone. Currently, iPhones will only let you get a logical image of the device. And that's okay. It's not the end of the world if you can only get a logical level. But that's only the file level. So you only can get the files that the phone sees on the device and report on those, meaning there's no deleted information. It can get you database files, but there's certain parts of the phone that you just can't get stuff from. For example, uh, if you get a logical level acquisition in certain tools of an iPhone, it's not going to take the email. So you're going to have to use another tool or another mechanism to grab the email out of those mail containers in the iPhone. So it's not going to get everything. But a logical level analysis of the phone is, is okay, but it's not the ideal part. The thing that we want to go after is the physical uh, image of it, which is the bit for bit. And the reason that we want a bit for bit image of that is because we want to get that part of the flash based memory so we can carve out the deleted information from the phone. So a bit for bit, what we call a full bit stream or a full physical dump of the file, which is just one big giant binary file then we can start to carve out the uh, individual databases and the deleted files and the deleted databases that may be in that file. So deleted text messages come in the physical analysis. The part, though, with physical analysis, and this is the um, the, the, the pyramid that, I'm, that is really good graphic to show, but it shows how the, the succession that you would get in these. Um, there at the top, you have a micro read, which is like an SEM, putting it under a microscope. That's like NSA level stuff. We don't have that kind of access. Really hard to do. You're literally putting the, the device or the drive under a microscope, and you're reading it based upon each binary bit. That's, that's just not feasible for us to do. Uh, a chip off is a little more feasible. We're basically removing the chip from the device, plugging it into something like a RIF box, an RI box, rip box, and we're plugging in and we're dumping that information off of the chip. The problem is it's time consuming and you're running into issues where you really have to know and have some specialized training on how to get the chip off and how to read that chip because you're literally pulling it out by the pin. So that takes some specialized training. Same way with JTAG. JTAG you're going to need some specialized training because you're going to have to tap into the battery. You're going to have to tap into the phone itself. you got to know how the JTAGs work because if you don't JTAG it correctly, you fry the phone. We're going to fry the board. Uh, Tiltec does chain trainings in that, uh, specialized trainings, which are kind of pricey, but you can uh, pick up certain stuff in that. The logical extraction is another method that we can use. Logical extraction, you get those files, but you don't get all the files back. And then the, um, the manual extraction is, is probably the, the, it's, you can probably, if you can get into the, the phone itself. If you can't get Celebrite to recognize it, you can't get any other tool to recognize it, manual extraction is the way to go. But most of the time we want to stick in this area right here because we want to get a hex dump at least. A physical dump of the device. So that's where you want to bring a tool like XRY, which is an ideal tool. You want to use a tool like Celebrite, which I brought in. Uh, we also have a, um, a tool that, that a lot of folks are using called Lantern. Um, if Usually if it breaks and fix it, we Norm and I were talking about how it broke or on the newest update of iOS. You may run into that. The tool works fine one day and it breaks the next on an update. You just have to wait it out sometimes. But make sure you have multiple tools to handle that. The nice part about hex dump as well, 
is that if you get a hex dump, you can bring it into multiple tools. So if I can get a hex dump from one tool, I can take that hex dump from from you know one tool, bring it into celebrating the code. So there's a lot of different back and forth mechanisms that I can use. Works out fairly well. Here's some other support that I want to put in, uh, kind of put in your hands. Uh, NIST uh, has some documentation out there. Uh, they also run what they call the CFTT, which is the Computer Forensic Tool Testing Project. They validate a lot of phone software and hardware. You'll find a lot of the major tools out there have been validated by them. NIST has those publications, that 800.11, I believe, was the one I just flashed up. SWIGDE has a bunch of core competency, those best practices. And NIST OSAC, uh, you're going to see some documentation get posted on this o NIST OSAC at the beginning of the year. There's also a forum on there for uh, phone forensics at Yahoo Groups. They're kind of picky. They're, they're, I, I got into it, and I don't know how I got into it as an academic, but I guess you could try to <laughs> join of the worst thing. It, they say law enforcement only, but uh, I... You know, I, I see some people in the private sector doing work that are on that list as well, so well no. But uh, it stays fairly active. You probably have about 30 to 40 messages a month. And uh, anywhere from private sector to detective folks. It's a Yahoo group. You have HTCIA, the High Technology Crime Investigation Association, has an email listserv. If you join HTCIA, I think it's 60 bucks per year, you also get access to their listserv. Uh, we're getting ready to hopefully spin up a chapter here in West Virginia. So right now they have a bluegrass chapter and a mid-Atlantic chapter with nothing in West Virginia. So we have all these people from like NW3C that's, that's a little bit north of us in Paramount. We have folks here in Huntington and folks right across the bridge in, Af in, in Ashland and Ohio. One of the things we want to do is we want to make it like a, a mid-Appalachian HTCIA chapter so we can have regional meetings. Hopefully, we'll have that in place by, by the conference next year. So that's, that's going to be one of our, our kind of pipe dreams, hopefully get that set up. IASIS, the International Association of Computer Investigative Specialists, uh, they have their own listserv that you can join. You can join that organization. They've recently kind of laxed, both HTCI and IASIS have kind of laxed uh, their membership to non-law enforcement. So... Uh, now would be a good time to pot, try to, you know, get into that particular field. If you are working in the industry, they're, they're pretty good about letting you uh, be a member of that group. You may not, they may call you like an associate member, that's what they call me now, rather than a full member, but you really get the frills and benefits of, of, of well. And then they have the HTCC, which is the High Technology Crime Consortium. They also have an email list as well. And I'm going to tell you in the world of cell phone forensics, these were lifesavers. If I had a problem, I couldn't get a device to recognize and jump out on the message board, send out an email within hours, I'd have a whole slew of different fixes. And usually someone had encountered that and they fixed it. Another thing is just to get certified in this. I can't understate that more. Take trainings. Get in trainings that you can. Um, I started out and I said, you know what, I want to get in as many competencies as I can. Uh, Celebrate has their Mobile Forensic Foundations, the CCLO, which is their Certified Logical Operator. It's a two-day course, but it just overviews of how to use their Celebrate equipment. I'm not trying to advocate any vendor-specific tool here. I'm just telling you what's out there. Uh, the Celebrate Certified Physical Analyst is a three-day training. And then once you complete all three of those, you can sit for your CCME. And I'll give you an idea of what CCME was. It's a, it's a test slash practical assessment. Um, I think I had to process a BlackBerry and an iPhone and an Android and answer questions on that. So it's a good competency before you start touching evidence to, to kind of feel better about you know, extracting data from that. If you're wanting to start at a really ground level, uh, the MPSC, the Mobile Phone Caesar Certification, that's a good ground level. I give that to the students at Marshall. It covers nothing but mobile phone seizure. But you've taken a test, it's like 20 questions, it's 25 bucks. Celebrate's foundations is like 30 bucks, I think. It's not very expensive to take these and go through the training. The training's expensive, the test out's not. But if you get certified in that, that's a competency that will survive you through court, even civil court, because now you can say I've, I've had some type of benchmark of certification. So as much as people like the dog on certification, Certification is good to show competency in a certain subject, especially if you're new to that. 
Later on, you know, I can prove competency by, you know, I've done this for 20 years. If you don't have that luxury to say something like that, you know, I'm getting the age now. I still feel like I'm young, but I can say, you know what, I've wrote book chapters on mobile phone forensics. You know, I could start to claim that. But, you know, if you're a new examiner coming out through the, you know, coming out of the gates, this may be a good place to start. So, uh, also, I will, I will try my best to pass this off to you. If you guys want this PowerPoint, um, shoot me an email. Uh, I'll try to put this together and get a link out there. Um, so keep an eye on the, um, the Twitter page as well. I'll try to get all this, the, these resources. Uh, this is a nice little decision-making chart that BK Forensics puts out, uh, the folks who do the mobile phone seizure certification. They have like a chart, and we hung this on the wall just to, okay, this is where the process that we go through. If the phone's off, do we leave it off? If the phone's on, where do we go next? It's a simple little chart, but it works out fairly well. So that's pretty much all I have for today. Um, if you're interested in any of our courses we offer at Marshall, our, our mobile phone forensic class, we get a little bit deeper in the weeds of physical decoding. That's a semester-long course, four hours a week. Um, any of our any of our curriculum at Marshall, if you're interested in, in coming down. Also, uh, if you look at our curriculum, I, I always throw this out as well. If you're interested in talk, coming and talking to our students, they're very raw. Uh, if you have uh, vendor uh, perspectives or industry perspectives, uh, then I might be able to leverage. Uh, I would greatly appreciate that. These these students, you know, they, they need to hear from you guys, and we need to hear from you, and you know, vice versa. We need to we need to be more inclusive as a community. I think talk to each other and figure out the problems. It's kind of silly of us, you know, holding up into our castle there. So uh, if you're interested in getting involved in that way, uh, maybe coming down and speaking if you're local, uh, get in contact with me if you have problems. Uh, you now have a new resource of get, getting before the people. I can't solve it. I have a lot of people that work in academia that do nothing but try to solve problems all the time. And I have a lot of friends in law enforcement that I can pass the information on. We'll, we'll get a fix for you. We'll try our, our very best. Too. So thank you, guys. Any, any questions you might have? Yes, sir. During the presentation, you mentioned that uh, 10 million Android users and their phones are affected malware. Yeah. Now, when you brought up the idea of okay, stopping at least four countries from injecting that into the market, um, how do you tell between a phone made purely in the U.S. the, the one overseas? I mean, even though it might have been manufactured here, but you might have a chipset XSSP or 6P made by do what we how do you say it? You know, they're in China. You know, it, it, really, this is an American-made phone, but the chipset came from China. Right. So, do you have a list of phones that are purely made in America? Yeah, so what the Pentagon did, I, I read this and, and I'm actually, uh, some, some contacts I have at State Department. One thing that they did is, see, they were putting contracts out to like Dell, and Dell was being made in Malaysia, so they had no way to control or have any quality control on the manufacturing process. So what they did is they put out a bid to say, hey, this is what we want in our bid. We want only American-made manufacturers, and we want oversight in the manufacturing process so we know what chips are going into that. And if you violate that, then we can terminate contract at any time. And then you're going to be responsible for helping us replace those. There was like a lot of little things that they put in there. Um, I don't know of any list that exists like that, and that's scary to me, and that's a good point you bring up there. Excellent question and, a, and, a, and an observation. I think it's something we really need to put on a radar. I, I don't think we're far from a full-scale attack in that regard, uh, especially uh, you know with somebody you know, pulling the trigger on a nice uh, DDoS attack utilizing you know, uh, compromised chipsets in these mobile devices. That would make a heck of a DDoS if I could fire you know a thousand cell phones at one time in a very powerful processing. But if, if you all have, you know, that's that's something we really need to put the awareness out there, that these phones are vulnerable, that not just the software on these phones and the operating system, 
but the physical components of this are susceptible to attack as well. It's not just in that layer 6 and 7 and 5, it's all the way down to layer 1. We have to secure every single layer of that, and we have to look at evidence in every single one of those layers, as, even in phones. The law enforcement folks that are, that are working on this at a federal level, they have no idea about stuff like that, or do they even know that that e could even be an issue? That's where I like to see the bridging, and I see this happening, it's excellent, of InfoSec to digital forensics, because we're learning from each other, and there's a synergy that's happening, but I learned so much this weekend. Love coming to these conferences because you see a different perspective from that. And uh, some stuff that you don't see on the forensic end that you'll see in an InfoSec conference and stuff that you'll see at a forensic conference that you'll never see in an InfoSec conference. We do need to converge our fields together and put our heads together. And I think I think we'll we'll do much better if we do that. Any other questions? We're running a little bit a little bit behind, but uh, are we good? Awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming. Appreciate it. Uh, if you ever want to, are down in the Marshall area, want to tour campus, want to stop by and hang out at the research labs, uh, check out some of our uh, mobile research that we've done. Uh, we do develop some Android tools to help in Android processing. Uh, we have um, we we have developed some stuff around Raspberry Pis to uh, set up these older Raspberry Pis to help process some of these Android. So, uh, if you're interested in any stuff like that, I can pass off information on, on how to do a build out and that. Um, you know, there's there's so many different resources you can come in and, and come down and, and visit us sometimes. Talk to our students. You know, we always welcome you on our campus. And it's always cool to be on college campus. You know, hang out. So, uh, students appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Yes, sir. Yeah. What types of conversations and topics would they benefit the most from? That's a good question. Um, oh, I just want to make for time. You know, it sounds it sounds great. We can we can always work you into a if if you have a specialized topic, we can work you into a course that that makes it specially especially for that course. Like you know, if, if it's a non mobile topic and it's more along the lines of like device security or something or. Or something like that, we can I can bring in my internal physics class, you know, something like that where you know they get kind of a fresh perspective. They get tired of listening to me. I'll be honest, they really do. And watching videos, it's nice to, to get that validation from a person that's in the field. Hey, this is how this is done. This is how we do it. And you know, they can. I knew if I were hearing that in college, if, if my professors brought in more industry professionals to kind of validate what we're teaching. I would be totally buying into that curriculum at different points in that, and, and that's, that's just, to me, that's that's a good quality education if we do that. So yeah, hit, hit me up, um, catch me before you leave, and we'll, we'll definitely try to work you in. And in any of, for any of you guys, you know, feel free to do that. Um, you know, I always like to have a nice little speaker bureau to, to draw on. Thank you guys.